your ignorance, you pray to gods and goddesses of metal and clay. Can you not understand that figures made by man cannot be gods? There is only one God, the living God. This God you speak of cares only for Hebrews, doesn't he? In the sight of God, there are no Hebrews, nor Greeks, nor Romans, nor slaves, nor free men. There is only mankind. What's this thing called Calvinism? What does it teach? And why do so many seem to have a problem with it? Well, hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to helping you know and experience the living God. I'm your host, Warren McGrew. And in this episode, we're tackling the topic of Reformed theology, aka Calvinism. And uh, in joining us in this is none other than uh, Kevin Thompson. Kevin is host of Beyond the Fundamentals, where he focuses on the need for sound epistemology, the use of, oh, you know, things that like reason and, and logic, you know, nothing nothing too critical in our, in our thought processes. But he focuses on those when studying the Bible and the numerous problems posed by Calvinism. And he's passionate about helping people understand scripture so they can better know Jesus and enjoy a life with him. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us, sir. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. Thanks for being here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm uh, happy to be here. Doing great. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I um, Now, you and I have, have been in contact via Facebook, it seems like, mm -hmm. seems like for years. I mean, I, when I was yeah. playing around with the idea a couple of years ago of writing a few articles, you were there and very encouraging. And so I mm -hmm. wanted to thank you for that. And it's been awesome seeing how the Lord's blessed your ministry and how you've been growing yeah, and absolutely. fighting the good fight over there at Beyond the Fundamentals. Do what we can. <laughs> now, uh, I understand you actually, uh, if, I'm, if I have this correctly, you started Beyond the Fundamentals back in, was it 2008? So yeah, it's uh, it really started off where we're doing live things and we're just going through the Bible verse by verse with live audiences. And I figured that when people would miss they would be discouraged because everything was cumulative. Like if we're on chapter 23 and you missed chapter since chapter 16, you may not want to come. So I started putting stuff online. So just for the local people in the area where we were, so if they missed a session, they could get the content and pick up where everybody left off. That's really the only reason I started putting anything on YouTube. And then um, one time, one of those lessons was covering... First Thessalonians four and the word elect was in there, and I and I also happened to have a past with Calvinism, and so I instead of taking a whole live session with people to go into Calvinism, I decided to address that word in that verse to show what kind of baggage comes along with it. Well, then that video got a lot more attention <laughs> than some of the other ones, and it started growing the audience beyond just the people that I was dealing with in person. And then it, I was like, maybe there's kind of a need for this. And I also felt that when it comes to the Calvinism stuff, there, I guess maybe you didn't ask this yet, but that what my goal is, is for people just to grow in Christ and transform into what they can be in. And what I've found is that there's a certain level of seriousness at which Calvinism can become a major obstacle for people. And it needs to be dealt with. And it needs to be dealt with very seriously. And what I'm finding in the literature and the material that's available out there, uh, they I don't see anybody else dealing with what I think the problem with Calvinism is. And so I figured I'd start putting my own material out there. And that, that's kind of how it went from there. And I've been learning also as, as it's gone. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, seen, I've seen, I mean, more videos of yours than I could probably count. And uh, I love your perspective on it because in many, many ways, we'll see the same problem, but you're approaching it from a completely different angle. Mm -hmm. you know, we both see the epistemological problem that Calvinism creates, but the yeah. way that you approach it uh, is often, I, I, I sit back and I go, why didn't I see that? You know, why, why didn't I think of that? Um, so I, I love your, your perspective on this, your insight. And, um, but it sounds, it sounds really like uh, just, Beyond the Fundamentals really just evolved somewhat organically. Uh, you, you talked about election, and next yeah. thing you know, that lightning rod has been hit, and, and you're getting yeah, a lot of attention. There's 
quite a significant audience out there who wanted to hear more about that. And I'm like, well, all right, we'll, we'll deal with it. And we just keep, keep dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't seem to go away. Does it? Uh, well, one of the things that I'm remiss about is what I, I really, honestly, I would like to not have to deal with Calvinism. <laughs> I would like to be with a group of people and we just study the Bible, but you know, Calvinism is always finding new people to dupe, if you will. So I was kind of remiss that all my stuff was starting. It's like all my content was about Calvinism. And I'm like, well, where's the other stuff? So now instead of switching from Calvinism to do other things, we've got enough, I guess, time. And not really, but <laughs> we're try trying to do both concurrently. So we're trying to do some scripture, verse by verse stuff, some group developmental stuff, and then also some Calvinism stuff. So we're trying to keep all things going right there. And um, so that's kind of scratching that itch as well. Yeah, and and it seems it seems like even if you said I'm just going to have a channel devoted to the essentials of the faith, right? The incarnation. Uh oh, now we've got to deal with total depravity. You know, so it seems it seems like these Augustinian concepts are really unavoidable because as you're teaching, right, youth, right, a lot of these misconceptions will come up that have to be addressed along the way. Right. Yet people will come in and they'll say. Oh, it's just reactionary theology. And it's like, no, we, we're teaching truth and we're addressing error uh, that's commonly held and, and needs to be addressed. Well, there is a reactionary component to it, especially at first. And, and one of the frustrating things about dealing with Calvinism is people don't understand the problem that, is, that it is until it hits them. Okay. And so you talk to a lot of rank and file Christians like Southern Baptists, Independent Baptists, and they're like, oh, okay, oh, that thing about predestination, okay, yeah, not a big deal. Well, then their church splits over it, or one of their family members gets duped into it, and then their Thanksgiving dinner gets ruined by it, and then they're not talking to their daughter or son anymore, and then it suddenly, it suddenly matters. And then that's when they start doing searches and they find people like me and Leighton online who are talking about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but and it's really for those people when you hit it, it's it's like not in their salience landscape. It's not relevant to them. And then, but if you're trying to teach truth to people, you find you keep running into Calvinistic presuppositions and vulnerabilities that they have that can be exploited by Calvinists and by Calvinism. And so it has to be dealt with. And then, it, you, so you, you we kind of also have to do the task of helping them see why it's relevant before it before they get hit with it. And then also deal with the material. Yeah, I mean, and, and the thing is, is it you're right. It, it you have to deal with those that are, for lack of a better word, suffering from it, and those that are headed yeah. blindly into it. And, right, right. And those are two different people that are going to be uh, impacted negatively, uh, right? But to varying degrees. So you're right. It, it it is twofold. But but what's what's the problem here? I mean, <clears throat> uh, Spurgeon said, Calvinism is the gospel. So. What, what do we need to warn Christians about the gospel for? I mean, uh, surely everyone can agree on the gospel. So, I mean, surely can't we all just be Calvinist and, and get along, Kevin? You know, I have a video called There Is No Gospel in Calvinism. But the word gospel means good news. And anytime you're giving news, news would be uh, proclaiming something that's true and that is also good to hear it works out in your benefit to hear this truth the pro anytime you're dealing with something that people are supposed to believe or truth claims what you might another way you might word christian doctrine especially the way they show up in statements of faith and confessions and things like that you might call them truth claims and anytime we're dealing with truth claims we need to ask the question how is it the truth is determined and I know there's the religious answer, well, you know, God determines truth, and, you know, of course, and the Bible comes from truth, but how, how or what process are we using to interpret the Bible in order to decide what is true? And it really comes down into what is, and, and once you sort that out, what, what are some other elements that might lead a person to think something is true when it's not? And then how do we identify and eliminate those things so that we really can deal with what is true. So, so what I found out, I, I started off dealing with Calvinism at like a tit for tat on the surface level 
kind of like at the, the, the top leaves of a tree kind of level, one versus the other, one, one computer program versus another pro computer program. But then what I found out is down at the root, there's a much deeper problem and you're, you're processing information. How do you process the information? And then you have a processor of information and how does that processor work and what might make that processor go wrong? What vulnerabilities does it have that can be exploited by bad processes or exposures or methodologies or other things like that. And what I've found in dealing with Calvinism is that it's not just a doctrinal issue of does the verse mean this or does the verse mean that. There's a whole bunch of things that go into causing people to believe things that are not true. And for example, some of those are you could be influenced by somebody that you admire very much. Like if you are reading a particular Puritan or something like that, and you admire something that they did, you might be strongly swayed by a person like that or somebody alive, like your professor or your pastor. And we don't realize how much those things influence us to think things are true that might not be true. Then there's the pressure of like an in-group. Let's say a let's say you have a really good relationship with a church for whatever reason. Maybe they have a good program for your kids. Who knows why? But then and you, you find out whether consciously or otherwise, that one of the ways to solidify your status in that in-group is to willfully affirm the things that they affirm, their statement of faith. And then pretty soon you find out that you're believing these things are true, but you haven't done any of the epistemic work to validate whether or not these things are true. Yeah. So there, there's really a lot of reasons. And, and there's some other things too. I'm, I can't... I used to be a, a fan of debates and things like that, but then I learned that the way our mind processes information, when we get defensive or when we're try or when we get emotionally upset, we become less capable. You know, you have two different parts of your brain. One is emotional, and one is one is your prefrontal cortex, where you can deal with problems and build designs. Maybe. Like you, in the limbic system of your brain, you could destroy a house. You could be sufficiently outraged to destroy a house in a few hours, but you could not also, but because of outrage, be motivated to use your prefrontal cortex to design and build a house, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And in a debate scenario, we get put in a defensive mode and we act in a less... <laughs> in a less capable way than, than, than is possible for us, than we could, than we have the capacity to do so. And so that, when you take sides in a debate, and oh, I can't think of any debate, maybe Augustine and Pelagius, or Augustine and Pelagius, you know. Mm -hmm. If you, when a debate causes you to take sides on things, that greatly affects your capacity to decide what is true because you just decided what is true for some really bad reasons. Yeah. And what we don't know is that when you decide one thing is true, that one thing cascades into a whole bunch of other areas that you haven't thought about. And that's exactly what happened with Calvinism. You, you know, <laughs> both Augustine and Pelagius are optimizing a whole system of soteriology on the same thing, which is a presumption of the human will. One's for, one's against. But that, that shared presumption was the wrong presumption. And then either way that you go, a whole bunch of other things cascade out from that. And that is the wrong, that's the wrong place to start. Well, that's how you get a lot of, of the human systematics well. is it subsequent yes. doctrines are, or subsequent doctrines are reactionary to a starting yes. faulty premise. Yes. You're trying to work it out. Well, uh oh, here's a problem. Let's smooth that out. Here's another right. problem right. that created. And you're always... You're always chasing the wrinkle with the iron. It never quite goes away. <laughs> you know, you're never, <laughs> you're never quite flattening it out. To use one of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the internet's uh, famous phrases. Um, well, well, with each one of those, you have to decide. Each each time you encounter something like a wrinkle that needs to be ironed out, you have to decide: Do I modify the paradigm to account for this new novelty that I found, or do I invent a new post hoc rationalization to justify why that? novelty fits the paradigm and if you do that too much you get to the point where you're you're quite delusional and I'm not saying that to be pejorative of any particular person that is a function of paradigms it doesn't matter which paradigm it is and even for non-Calvinist we do we do the same thing with our paradigms 
So it's, I'm not calling Calvinists delusional to be pejorative, but I'm saying that is the function of paradigms. And, and when a group decides, hey, we're going to change the paradigm to, so that it better reflects reality, and another, another group decides, no, we're going to invent a clever post hoc rationalization to account for this novelty, now you, that's when you split and you kind of have speciation of the idea groups, you know, and then you, you know, multi denominations go out, and then you have several different varieties of Calvinism too. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, the, in, the way information happens to humans is really at the basis of all this more so than what the propositional doctrinal statements really are at, at the end state, which is really less important than the root issue of how do we deal with information to ascertain truth in the first place. Well, and, and you, it, it's, you're really, you're inheriting not thinking processes, but you're inheriting pre-established thoughts that you conform That's to exactly right. really researching their validity. That's exactly right. And uh, that, that was what I woke up to one day, uh, mm -hmm. almost seven years ago, you know, and I, I looked around and I felt mm -hmm. like everybody else was still sleeping and I was awake and I responded <laughs> yeah. like a madman and I went around telling exactly everybody right. and trying to shake them awake and they looked at me like I was a madman and I, I kind mm -hmm. of was. Um, but you, know, you, you, learn to, <laughs> you learn to temper the zeal with wisdom a little bit, but you still are trying to, to speak truth in a way that those that are sleeping might be woken up by it. Um, yes. Now, you I mean we yes. have okay? So we have Calvinism as the gospel. We've we've addressed. Well, no, no, it isn't. It, it's, we haven't addressed that. Do we want to address that? Yeah. Let's 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 dig into that. It is is Calvinism the gospel? Now you said it. There is no gospel in Calvinism because it's good news. But let's let's really put a fine point on that. There can't be any God. There can't be any good news in Calvinism. And the reason, well, there is. There can be good news in Calvinism, but it's not the. It's not what's identified as the gospel in Scripture. In God's, in Scripture, of course, you know, every time you identify First Corinthians fifteen one through four, there's somebody in the audience who's like, "Well, it's more than just that." And I know, but that's really the gospel in a nutshell is, you know, Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and he was buried and rose again the third day according to Scripture. And then he was seen of many people, Peter and above 500 others. So that's the gospel in a nutshell, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for sins. And when Paul is saying that in 1 Corinthians 15, he is recalling when he said it to them the first time, which is before they believed. So you can look at a non-believer and you can say, Christ died for our sins. You can say that to a non-believer because that's exactly what Paul said he did. Well, if, if Calvinism is true, whether or not Christ died is not really good news or not for you. The, the good news for you is whether or not you're elect. Okay? If you're elect, Christ died for you, but... That's just really a peripheral of the fact that God elected you in the first place from before the foundation of the world. So if you're a Calvinist, if Calvinism is true, then the elect were safe and secure since from before the foundation of the world and never really had anything to be saved from. They've always been secure. They've never not been secure in the Calvinist paradigm. If you are not elect, there is no savior for you. You see? Mm -hmm. So... The, the, in Calvinism, the only good news is whether or not you're elect. That's the only news that matters, right? And all the, all the stuff that Scripture calls the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins according to Scripture, that is really inconsequential. What's consequential in Calvinism is whether or not you're elect. So the, there, is no, there is no gospel in Calvinism unless, if you were honest, you would have to say maybe you're elect or not. But that's really not good news either. You know, well, and, but the and, gospel you know, that's in the Bible is not is not good news in Calvinism. One of the things that I've been pointing out, and some of the the guys are making comments uh, in there, um, is is I, I like to demonstrate, and I'm not bringing out the sharpie, and I'm not bringing out the calculator, though I'll reference some guys. One of the things that I'll do <laughs> is I'll demonstrate how their presuppositions actually make truth unknowable. And they can only hope that they're elect. That's they true. can claim they're That's elect, right. but they have no basis for confidence in any spiritual truth claim that they have because their premise completely undermines their ability to actually claim truth. Yeah, it, undermine, it undermines any logical or rational process. It does. And, Absolutely. And, and, and so you say, well, okay, even if there's no gospel for the, the reprobate, who's always been eternally reprobated, decreed to be reprobated, 
and there's only good news for the elect, the problem for the Calvinist seems is they can't know their elect. They can only hope they're elect. That's correct. That's but correct. much like in, in, in is my understanding of Islam, the adherent can stand before God at judgment, believing they've been elect and discover they're not. So any claim that they may have isn't based in scripture. They have no reason for, for having any sort of um, justification for this claim. It's just wishful thinking. And yet they proceed through life as though it's a certainty. So yeah, the, one of the issues I like to point out is that if, you know, Bible says Christ died for all. First in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen and fifteen, very clearly Christ died for all, and uh, Christ tasted death for every man. He gave himself a ransom for all. He's a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. So when it comes to how do you know Christ died for you? If you don't believe the passages, which are very, very clear that Christ died for all, it's propitiation for the sins of the whole world. If you don't believe those, there is no passage you can turn to to show that Christ died for you. <laughs> right. Okay, right. There isn't one. Now, the, now, what they'll have to resort to is, well, I have the witness of the Spirit. I have this. I have, and this, they'll say, I, but there's no Scripture. You're pointing to your works and your experience. And so, well, Scripture talks about Whoever believes is saved. Yeah, what about evanescent grace? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of Calvinism too. And so <laughs> while scripture does talk about the witness of the spirit, and if you believe you're saved, um, those are still, you're still relying on the action that you did to indicate to you that you're, the, that you're elect. You don't have anything in scripture on which you can base whether or not Christ actually died for you. You have to look to your own works and experience. And that's, Pretty funny for a, for a group of people who call other people man centered. <laughs> there, there is, there is a it's so ironic inconsistency <laughs> and hypocrisy there, and and I and I laugh because I was guilty of it. You know, when when yep. when I was a Calvinist, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I probably am doing other Calvinists a major disservice by thinking they were as as good and despicable as I was. Um, but I, I, I think I was a model Calvinist and, uh, and, and I, I held on to those inconsistencies and just some really horrendous, horrendous doctrines and, and beliefs. And, and one of the things I wanted to do tonight and, uh, is, is really just kind of dig into the way that Calvinism, because the, the question is, is what's wrong with Calvinism? And we can get into mm -hmm. some of the doctrinal issues, but ultimately I'll, I want to look at two is how it impacts our understanding of ourselves, uh, you know, as, as sinners, what does that mean? How it impacts how we understand repentance and reconciliation, how we understand the very nature of God, you know, because one of the things that, that Calvinism is, is known for is claiming that it is the one that, that best elevates and honors God as, you know, the most sovereign. And so I wanted to dig into what is this, you and I both know this, but for the audience who many may not, when a Calvinist says God is sovereign, do they simply mean he's king of kings, lord of lords, the highest authority, giver of law, grantor of mercy, or is there something else? Are we using the same dictionaries here? Well, when they say it, I mean, uh, the question would be, why do they say it? Why do they feel the need to say it? But when they say it, you have your John Piper people who think that the word sovereign means meticulous control of every minute particle in the universe, including molecules and submolecules as far down as you go, meticulous control. So there's no there's no quantum physics in, in that kind of sovereignty. There is no uh, there's no wave propagation theory or anything or anything or any probability distributions. There's nothing like that in Calvinism, in that kind of Calvinism. And of course, you have people who call themselves reformed, they don't like the word Calvinism, and they, there are varying degrees of how mm. much determinism they're willing to sign their name to. Um, if you use sovereignty in a very practical sense, it just means the guy at the boss, a king is sovereign, but it doesn't mean there's nobody disobeying um, down at the lower level who goes against the king's will. That's why you fight wars and punish evildoers. Um, you can have a person can have sovereignty in their own arena, like um, a, a a circus performer can juggle twelve bowling pins while holding a flaming sword in his mouth. You know, and he can 
while he's on a unicycle. He can establish sovereignty in that thing, right? But the Calvinist God, you know, so human sovereignty is basically scenario driven. It's capability driven based on the scenario that you happen to be in. Am I, am I sovereign enough to, to walk myself out of this room into the kitchen without falling over? Okay. Do I have sovereignty in that task, in that, in that context? And the, the Calvinist God, according to some of their epithets against, against what I would call Bible believers, the Calvinist God cannot retain sovereignty in a scenario where humans have free will. And if that's the case, that would make him not sovereign, which would make him not God by their own definition. So it is, it is a self-refuting claim, first of all. The, a, a more interesting question to me, epistemologically, is why they have to claim that. The narrative of presenting Calvinism starts with God being in control and God's sovereignty. That's what it starts with. If you look at Kuiper's book on evangelism, he tries to tie soteriology to the sovereignty of God as a starting point. That is the narrative. But that is not the foundational point of the narrative structure. So that's the, the presentation narrative. But the structure of the narrative, the root of it, is total depravity. Mm -hmm. And that comes across several different ways, like the total inability of man, the total depravity of man, or the necessity of, like R.C. Sproul says, at the heart of Reformed theology lies this axiom, regeneration precedes faith. Well, it has to because you're so totally depraved, you can't have faith until you're regenerated. So that's really another way of talking about total depravity. Total depravity cascades out several things. Like if you're totally depraved, you know, what, what if you want to get saved and you can't? Well, you won't. Well, well, then who decides who does get saved? Well, ultimately God decides. The, there's your sovereignty of God. It's not actually the starting point of the narrative. It is a reactionary point to if I presume total depravity as a premise, then I need something else that responds to the gospel in my place if I wind up saved. What is that going to be? And they've selected, as it cascades out, and they do their post hoc rationalizations back in the days of Augustine, they decided that would be God. And so if that's the case, now I have to bolster, I have to present and package this system from the top down with God being in control in a way that results in total depravity, but actually started with it. So it's kind of, to me, when a Calvinist says it all starts with God being in control, it's actually deceptive. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're just passing on a deception that happened to them, but epistemologically, that's deceptive as a starting point for Calvinism. And I, I think one of the things, too, and I, and again, I, I, I try to turn the mirror. I, I, I want to know what makes me think the way that I do mm -hmm. uh, as much as I want to know what makes everybody else think the way that they do, you know? And mm -hmm. so what I was discovering in my own thinking and thought processes and the way I was going to scripture, I was affirming diametrically opposed concepts. But because I had appealed to a category distinction, I wasn't even aware I was doing it. Can, I, yeah, it, explain that a little bit. Sir? Explain that category distinction a little bit. Well, God, don't mind. God is holy, right? Mm -hmm. God is holy. And he is right, and he is good, and he is love. And, and I think mm -hmm. those are essential Christian truths. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I was also holding all this other stuff that I had packed into the term of, of God's sovereignty, where meticulous you know, determinism, where everything was decreed. And um, I had kind of a Stonewall Jackson sort of a, a view of God's sovereignty. You know, he would stay on the saddle and say, well, if God wants me to be shot, during the war, I'll, I'll get shot. And I think eventually he, he was, um, <laughs> but because he wouldn't, he wouldn't get down off the horse. He, he believed in divine determinism and it was just, it was going to happen. It was going to happen. And, and so on, on one hand you go, okay, God's in control and God is holy. But yet ultimately, if you go to God is in control, then, and, and you're talking about determinism, then why am I a sinner? Okay. Well, you're a sinner because you inherited this, nature, this wrath, this guilt, this concupiscence from Adam. Okay, well, God's in control. So why did I inherit it? Well, God cursed mankind as a punishment. Well, keep. let's go back. Why did God curse mankind as a punishment? Mm -hmm. Why did Adam sin? 
Well, God decreed it. Well, why did God decree it? Well, for his glory. So God decreed Adam's sin mm -hmm. so that he could make me a child of wrath. Mm -hmm. But then let's go forward with it, right? Ultimately, God is responsible for sin, but let's keep going forward now instead of going back. If, if total depravity is a punishment against mankind for Adam's sin, and you're going to affirm the reformed view of atonement, Jesus had to bear our punishment. So Jesus had to have a totally depraved nature in order to bear our punishment, but that would strip him of the right to be the spotless redeemer. And so you have all of these problems, whether we go back and we trace it all the way back to God and accuse him of authoring evil, or we go forward and we see how it causes problems in our redemption and denies truly that Christ you know, was, was our redeemer. And, and so, but, but here I am, you know, affirming mm -hmm. that God is holy, God redeemed me, God's, God is sovereign, but I'm not even seeing how these different views are impacting one another. I'm, I'm completely blind to it at the time. Yeah, that's, that's it, it's kind of shocking to realize the level of blindness that we could be at in a, in a previous state. Um, that kind of hits home on, uh, we had a question by somebody, didn't we? Is that a good time to talk yeah, about Yeah, that? Let, me, let me bring this up here. Um, this is very free form. So at any point, like, let's just, if you have a question or you want to go somewhere. But we had a, we had a question before the show began. Uh, Michael Allen sent this over. And he said, uh, can you please address the problem of the negation of the revelation of God in Calvinism, that the revelation of God in the incarnate Christ has been supplanted in Calvinism by a still hidden God, a hidden deity who can command one thing, but secretly will and decree another, whose attributes of truth, love, righteousness, holiness, etc., can be so grossly unlike any human conception of those attributes as to make any correspondence between divine act and human understanding unintelligible. I can leave that back up there for you if you want. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. I didn't know if you were going to say something or if you want me to start talking. <laughs> oh, no, I was catch, <laughs> catching my breath here. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw that over to you. If Scripture is a revelation from God, which we all will affirm that it is, if you're a Calvinist, you have a difficult time determining whether or not it's a true revelation from God or whether it's a misleading revelation from God. Because ultimately, I... Calvinism is essentially Gnostic for two different reasons. It's Gnostic in its origins. And because, you know, Augustine, Augustine basically reverted back to his Manachian Gnosticism in order to try to have a formula that would defeat Pelagius. But it's also Gnostic in its practice of, at the end of the day, a Calvinist claims to have understanding and knowledge that comes from outside scripture. At the same time, they're they're criticizing the Bethel movement and they're criticizing the charismatics who have extra scriptural revelation. They ultimately believe they have access to information that non-Calvinists don't have and they can't show you it in scripture. They say, well, it's a secret. It's a secret thing. God has a secret will that he doesn't tell us about. Then what on earth is scripture for? What is it telling us? And ultimately it's a lie. So a couple of examples occur to me. There's a very simple verse, a very simple verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. It's a very simple verse about the will of God. And it says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, right? That's a very clear statement about what the will of God is. Now he's talking to Christians there. So we know that some Christians, like the one in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, they go and commit fornication. In Calvinism, the fornication was the will of God. London Baptist Confession, chapter 3, paragraph 1. Everything that comes to pass was divinely decreed from before the foundation, all that kind of stuff. Okay, Everything that comes to pass. And if that is a true statement, then nothing that follows it is necessary to be said. So in, in Calvinism... The guy committing fornication is the will of God, but they have to create two different wills of God now. Now I have a secret will of God and a revealed will of God, or I have a decretive will of God and a and a pre a prescriptive or permissive. What do they call that? What's the word they use there? It's a p word. Or prescriptive or what was the first one you said? Permissive. 
preceptive, preceptive. Oh, preceptive. A preceptive, like a precept. You see. Mm-hmm. So they have this. So they split it up into two wills of God. I have a decretal where, like a decree, decretal will of God. And you don't know about that one. That's not revealed. That's somewhere tucked away. You'll never see it. But Calvinists know about it. That's where the Gnosticism comes from, for as far as I'm concerned. And then you have a preceptive will of God. The, the precept you should follow. Now. That can go over well if you're talking about a, a command like rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. That would be a perceptive will of God, but not everybody obeys it. This is not a command or a directive or guidance. This is a statement about what the will of God is. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from, fa- from fornication. So, They have a secret hidden Bible or secret hidden revelation. They somehow know, they somehow know that the guy that committed fornication in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 5, 1 through 5, really was the will of God, even though there's no verse that says it. Whereas somebody like me, I would look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, I'd say, no, it's not the will of God. It's very clearly not the will of God. And in 1 Corinthians 5, it's, it's also presented as a bad thing there. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would believe in things like rebellion and in things like not being the will of God. But if you are a strict deterministic Calvinist in London Baptist Confession, chapter 3, paragraph 1, everything that comes to pass is decreed by God. There, what, what you wind up with is you have a Bible that's a lie. It tells you something's the will of God when it's not. And there's a really will, real will of God that was not revealed to you, which Calvinists somehow Gnostically know about. And <laughs> you can't rebel because everything you do is the will of God. Yeah, the, the, so if I were the most, yeah, I could commit any crime and it would be the will of God. The most evil, vile sinner is doing yes. precisely what God decreed him to do. Just like the yes. most righteous, obedient follower of Christ is doing precisely what God decreed him to do. Both are doing God's perfect will. Absolutely perfect will. One, no rebellion, no sin. Yeah, one, There'd be no such thing as sin. No, there isn't. There's no rebellion. It's just per- perfect obedience. It's perfect obedience. And one will, one will be given eternal life for obeying the will of God, and one will be eternally damned for obeying the will of God. Of, for obeying the will of God. Yeah. So, so a Calvinist could say, yes, but the Scripture tells us to do certain things. Yeah, but as soon as I become enlightened by Calvinism, I know that Scripture doesn't matter. I know that that's not really the will of God. I know that whatever I actually do is the will of God. I've, I've learned that I am the revelation of God. I, like what I do, if I go kill babies, that is the revelation of God. And the Scripture that tells me not to kill people, that's, not, that's just a facade but since I have had this wisdom Gnostically imputed to me by some means other than revealed scripture, I know that what I do is the revelation of God, not scripture. So in Cal- a consistent Calvinist, a consistent determinist, mm. in, to really capture the will of God, the heart and mind of God, you would have to regard scripture as a lie. Stop considering that at all and try to make sense of the world and God just by seeing what happens because that's the real Bible. That's the real revelation of the will of God. Everything you see would be. Mm, that's a strong point. That's a strong point. And, and, and you're, you're absolutely right there because if, if you hold these precepts, these extra biblical philosophical precepts that are inherent throughout all of Calvinism, you, you go to the scripture and you see, you know, oh, God, God's not willing that any should perish. Oh, I, that, that, that's trash. That's trash. Because yeah, yeah. my Calvinism tells me God in eternity past was delighted at the thought of these people perishing because it was going to bring him the most glory and honor. Mm-hmm. You know, and so they, they, you're right. They absolutely, scripture goes out the window in favor of a divine gnosis of of secret knowledge so so that i mean scripture going out the window that really is the key of the matter that really is the heart of the matter and when it comes to philosophy or anything else one thing i strongly encourage anybody to do if you're dealing with calvinism it's you have to realize that if you think any of their doctrines are cured by anything else other than scripture you're on the wrong path so you don't cure 
You don't cure Calvinism by talking about free will or the love of God or whatever you want it to be. Not that there's anything wrong with those things as themselves, but the problem with Calvinism is whether or not Scripture is true. That is the only problem with it. And it really is. That's really the only problem with Calvinism, whether or not Scripture is true. The problem, and if the Scripture problem is have, true, though, with the Calvinist is their blinded scales in which they, they eisegete into Scripture. So when you're witnessing to a particular Calvinist, they believe Scripture is true, but they're operating as though it isn't. And so they believe the proposition that Scripture is true. Mm -hmm. They do. So there are four different, I don't know how much you've seen on the channel, but there are four different kinds of knowing. Yeah. And there's this most shallow kind of knowing is propositional knowing, like propositional statements, like uh, cats are mammals. That is a propositional statement. And you can make a propositional statement that the Bible is true, or the Bible is a book full of, you know, green goblins and blue letters. It doesn't matter what, it's just a proposition. So you can willfully affirm a proposition. And, and I think... You know, when you say, what's the problem with Calvinism? There is a vulnerability built into Christianity. And Calvinism is really just an artifact of that vulnerability. In other words, it's just an outgrowth of that vulnerability. And what that vulnerability is, is it, before Augustine. But the only reason August Augustine could get away with what he got away with was because this vulnerability pre-existed August, Augustine. And that vulnerability is... We think we can willfully assert things into being true. Mm -hmm. Like I think, like the virgin birth, whether it did or didn't happen, my belief in it does not make it so. You see? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you, and so take, take anything you consider to be an essential of the faith. God is love. Whether or not you believe that doesn't make it so. But we have this built-in vulnerability where we treat faith as if it's something where we, wherein we can willfully assert things into being true that we have no basis for believing are true. I've, I've, it's not epistemically warranted. I've touched on this before where it's a faith rooted in bias and un, it's an unreasonable faith because it, right. it's not based in actual reasons. It's just based in assertion and, and bias and these preconceived ideas, but it, if you actually poke it and, and you come in and you start opening it up and exploring and, and, and uh, dissecting what the reasons are for that faith to be there, it's an empty, blind, baseless, you know. Uh, it, 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 well, so, so it takes us right back down to what's the purpose of Christianity. And I was kind of shocked to learn from a atheistic cognitive scientist that's something that I did not know. I did not realize before. And what that is, is that huh, literacy really exploded after the printing press. And because now you have books everywhere. And so the capacity to read is a lot more. The, the psychotechnology of reading became a lot more widespread. And before that, it wasn't really that widespread. Well, just the act of silent reading did not become popular till about the 1200s, okay? And that's something, you know, I wasn't around then, so I didn't know. <laughs> so any kind of reading or exposure to reading would take place in a communal setting. Somebody, somebody would be reading out loud, everybody else would be listening. So it was a very communal, interactive thing. And you might say that the, the goal or the thrust of Christianity in the places where it was done not the worst would be that it, it is for the transformation of the individual toward, to, toward something. But when we transitioned over into silent reading and into, like, and into everybody becoming literate, we kind of forgot that and we transitioned Christianity into just compiling all the propositional fact statements that we possibly can that we think are true. And while there's not necessarily anything wrong with a good fact statement, we kind of lost sight of the need to transform the individual into someone who can be a wise person and who can actually follow the way that is Jesus Christ. I mean, somebody who can look to what, what did Jesus Christ do in the abstract? He took on responsibility for something that was not his fault. He took on the sin of the whole world. And then he took that on himself 
and did something with it to make something better as a result, regardless of the cost, okay? And if you are trying to transform into a person that is like Christ, that can do that on a smaller scale, you take on responsibility, you take on the cost with it, maybe it doesn't kill you like it did him at that level of responsibility, but then you, you're able to turn that into something that rises from the dead and turns out better than it ever was to begin with. That's, that's, that's the pattern there. You could transform into a person that is like that, or you can memorize a systematic theology full of propositions that really never did anybody any good anywhere, anytime. And I think it would even be a, a misnomer to call it intellectualizing because it, it's, not, it's not very intellectual. It's just simply memorization. It, it's simply absorbing a, a preconceived belief without understanding what that's right. to formulate that belief to begin with memorization we, we what we need to do really is go back to first principles thinking and so i've been asking people lately to examine their axioms and like you said the word premises that might be considered an axiom that the rc sproul quote we said just a second ago he says at the heart of reformed theology is um, the axiom regeneration precedes faith well <laughs> if that's true that's it is not an axiom it's a finding. It's a derivative. Okay. So why do you think regeneration precedes faith? Well, faith. Well, I would believe, I think the Bible teaches that. Okay. So why do you think that's true? Because I believe the Bible's true. Why? Okay. Why do you think the Bible's true? Because it came from God. Well, how do you know God's not a liar? Well, I'm just presuming he's true. So now what I've done with that, as soon as I hit a circularity like that, like, I got God, truth, in the Bible. I really can't prove any one of those three things. I can't prove God exists. I can't prove God's true. I can't prove the Bible's from God. I can't prove that, okay? So I have to recognize those three as, as my axiom, axiomatic starting points. God exists. God is true. Bible came from God, and the Bible's true. And the truth, God, Bible, and the truth are really the three things you're working with. Anything else other than that should not be axiomatic. It can be derived from those three things, right? So if you believe that uh, the virgin birth, that, kind of, that is not an axiom of a Christian worldview. That is, a, that is a, what you might consider a true finding, but it's found because you start with the proper axioms of Scripture coming from God and being true. And then you see what Scripture has to say, and then you arrive at that proposition. So we don't know what our premises are, and I'm, I'm trying to promote something called axiomatic awareness, like know what your axioms are, and then axiomatic minimalism. Reduce your sense making down to the, the fewest axioms you possibly can that you would have to have in order to result in a Christian worldview, okay? Mm -hmm. And then every time any issue comes up, any doctrinal issue that you can possibly think of, you go back to first principles thinkings, which means you go back to the axioms and you start from there. And eventually you're going to have to come across, you're going to have to come across interpretation process too. So if we all, if we can agree on what the axioms are and that like the tulip, none of the tulip, even if it's true, none of the tulip should be axiomatic. It should all be derived from the axioms. And I think even a Calvinist should be able to agree on that. So what that, what the difference should be is what is the proper process to interpret the evidence that we have, the Bible being the evidence. We think the Bible's true, so let's interpret that evidence and then see where it leads. And that the question that comes up is, what's the process? What that would further imply is that as we are teaching Christianity, we should not be teaching correct conclusions of what the doctrines are, but we should be teaching what the correct process is. In other words, we should be developing capacity to discern and interpret in people rather than just the memorization of rote propositions. Well, and, and you look you look at the, the words of scripture where he, he says, you're not ready for, for meat, you're still on milk. It wasn't yeah. that they weren't ready. Hebrews chapter 5, yeah. It wasn't that they weren't in, in ready First Corinthians to memorize deeper truths. Is it that they weren't ready to process and understand and, 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 and internalize and, and right. understand why these deeper truths are true. And in 1 Corinthians 3, when that is used, they lack wisdom. And Hebrews chapter 5, they lack discernment. And it is actually the practice of discernment that 
leads a person that has to be done on a consistent basis to take a person into being a wise person. We try to take shortcuts. And here's the problem. This is a, this is a real problem. It's a real problem. You spend five years studying the Bible and you find all these great truths. And you're like, wow, this is really great. I, wanna, I want to preserve these truths in the next generation. These findings are so good, I want to pass them on. And we make the mistake of just telling them the conclusions. You see? Mm -hmm. That is scalable. You can take those conclusions and you can teach them to thousands of people. But you know it's a lot harder than that? To take people and teach them how to arrive at good conclusions. And by the way, while you're doing it to really teach them how to do it, you kind of have to not tell them what your conclusions were. That's hard to do. I mean, if you're really going to develop people who... So, the say, say you're teaching a doctrinal class and say you have 10 points of doctrine you're trying to teach, but instead of starting with the conclusive proposition, cats are mammals, the Trinity exists, whatever it is, instead of starting with that, you start back at first principles thinking and work your way forward. It's a lot slower. It takes a lot longer. And then you will have a lot more, probably a higher attrition rate. <laughs> and But you develop that generative capacity in the people. And then they have the ability to generate good conclusions. And it's anti-fragile. Once you've taken them through that process for 10 doctrines, you probably can't lie to that person either. You probably can't deceive that person. And then when you put them with 15 other people who have also been trained in the same processes and they're doing distributed cognition together, that would be so anti-fragile, it would be impervious to lies. It would be impervious to it. I mean, really. It, it would really be the Ephesians 4 edification model where they're no longer children tossed about to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but every joint is supplying the edification just like we see in Ephesians 4. And that, I, mean, I was just going to say, we're talking about biblical discipleship. Yes. Teaching people yes. what it means to follow the way, the truth, and the life, and why we and, do that. And it's a bold statement to say what I'm about to say, but I, I dare say that what we have called discipleship in Western Christianity for probably anywhere that you or I have ever heard of it is not what's going on in Ephesians 4. Yeah. And so I, I, I think as a church, we should stop talking like we know what we're doing and go back into discovery mode to find out what is this thing Paul's on about in, in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 2 where every joint is supplying because that's not we're still in broadcast mode in our churches. We're still broadcasting propositions and statements of faith and we're arguing about these what you might call nerve ending points, like doctrinal endpoints. Okay, if you if you think of your nervous system and that the endpoint is like a propositional statement, like total depravity is true. That's really not the level at which these issues need to be dealt with. That's that's not even, it's a symptom of a symptom, and, and what, <laughs> really. What this is doing is it's not only perpetuating bad doctrine and a lack of, of good thinking, but it, it's also it's also building a Christianity that's, that's very shallow, that doesn't have a deep faith, and, and it, it, yep. it's doing a disservice both to the body and to those unbelievers that encounter that particular strain. And it, it's, it's so... it's Right, right. We're setting people up. If, if we teach people all the right non-Calvinist things right now, we're setting them and their kids up to become Calvinists 20, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Yeah. Because they won't, they won't have any discernment or wisdom capacity. They won't have any pros, procedural knowledge or participatory knowledge with you know distributed cognition or perspectival knowledge that also comes from distributed cognition. They won't have any of the other four kinds of knowing. They just have the procedural, and they're going to fall prey to Calvinism. They'll, generation after generation, there will always be Calvinist revivals taking advantage of stupid people turning into Calvinists. And you have to be stupid before you become a Calvinist, otherwise you wouldn't become one. And that's we have to, pr we have to produce Christians who aren't stupid to start with. And it, once once you've been indoctrinated, uh, it, it's it's very hard to see those those missteps. There was a a yes. really a really awful awful uh, comedy that came out. I think in the late '90s or early 2000s, and I remember uh, where it was a kung fu movie, and the master taught this one pupil who nobody liked 
the wrong way to fight because they thought it was it's, it's called kung pao it is kung pao and they taught him, <laughs> taught him so cute to fist technique and so the student would go to war in battle and he's like you're no match for my face to fist technique and he would get destroyed and blood we taught them the wrong way as a joke <laughs> And, and I, see, I love that I movie. See so many, so many Christians, Calvinists and non-Calvinists alike, who've embraced this kind of presuppositional paradigm instead of actually digging in and, and rooting out their, their doctrine. But it, it's almost like they're going into spiritual war warfare with a face-to-fist technique, and they're getting that's right, destroyed. that's right, that's exactly right. Yeah, it, um, it just, it's just it's heartbreaking, and I'll encounter atheists. And I'll hear atheists say, well, I'm only an atheist because God decreed it. And I, I, I have to stop them and say, no, you're an atheist because, uh, one, you, you, your understanding of who God is is based on a non-Christian paradigm. But two, you're choosing rebellion. Um, you know, let me, let, me, let me stop and break this down and tell you a little bit about well, the God of Scripture. I don't know. I don't know. What if, what if, Warren, what if we in Western Christianity are so wrong about God that atheists are correct about something. What if they are correct for rejecting the version of God that they see presented in Western Christianity? Mm -hmm. I suspect that that much of atheism might actually be correct. Now, I'm not an atheist and I'm, I'm not promoting atheism, but I think, I think they're kind of onto something, but they're just poor at articulating exactly what it is they're discovering. So whatever it is they're against, whatever God they're against, I'm probably against it too. I, I find more often than not, I'd say, you describe this Christian God to me, and they do, and I go, that's horrible. That's not out of the Bible. <laughs> like, we can agree. I will condemn that. And, and, and more often than not, when we're talking, uh, there, I'll find when I'm witnessing to an atheist, this happens a lot online, <clears throat> the atheist mm -hmm. is saying, I reject this Western Christianity, this idea of an Augustinian, you know, um, deterministic, mm -hmm. in many instances, Calvinistic view of, of God. And I'm able to come alongside of them and say, actually, that's not, that's not Christian orthodoxy. Uh, that's well, there are atheists who are just as deterministic as Calvinists. There are, there are, there are. Unfortunately. The, the Newtonian physics, every, you know, first cause, everything else is going to happen that way. Yeah. But what's interesting, though, is we'll be talking and they'll say, you know, Warren, if that if that were true, that that's very appealing. And usually about that time, a Calvinist will come on and tell them they can't repent because, you know, they were decreed not to be able to or that, that they're, <laughs> they need to repent, even though God may not have decreed them to. There, there's several different arguments here, but usually it's more of a, a pious chest thumping than it is an actual yep. discipleship and virtue signaling yeah. refutation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, that's... <laughs> let's uh, let's look. Okay, we've we've touched on this a little bit here, and we've I think we've gotten into some really really good stuff here. Um, we have we have this systematic called tulip. We've got total depravity, unconditional election, mm -hmm. limited atonement, irresistible grace, preservation or perseverance of the saints. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a reformed atonement theory that ties all this together really nicely. Um, but at the end of the day, what, what I found when I was going through this was I would read about the, the goodness of Christ. I would read a statement about him and I would filter it through my Calvinism mm -hmm. and it created so much clunkiness. What I found <laughs> was if I was being honest I actually didn't trust Christ with my doctrine. So I wasn't bringing him a lot of these um, inconsistencies. Hmm, that's interesting. But yeah, that's interesting. I was afraid that if I brought them to him, he may prove to let me down. And that was something that I had to come to <laughs> wow. with in my own heart. Is every Calvinist doing that? I'm not going to say that. But I'm, I'm going to be very open and say that I realized that's what I was doing, that when I would encounter these inconsistencies, I would dismiss them and appeal to mystery. I mm -hmm. would say, well, we won't know till we stand before him or some things we weren't, we're just finite, he's infinite. And I mm -hmm. had my pat answers, God's sovereign, I'm not. But if I was being honest, 
I was scared. And there was this fear wow, yeah. that I didn't, I, I was afraid that if I brought him these difficult questions, that he may let me down, that he may not be who he claimed to be. But at some point, you know, I don't, I don't know if everybody does this, but I had to. I just said, okay, Jesus, you're, you know what? I'm, I'm 30 some odd years old. It's time. Mm -hmm. I, I've been believing in you for a long time, but it's time I start trusting you. So I'm going to bring yeah. you all of these issues and I'm going to trust you uh, because I believe you're true, but, but we're going to find out. And, and so mm -hmm. I brought him all of these difficult to answer questions. And what I found was, oh my goodness, uh, I, I, I believe in you, but I don't know much about you. I, I believe in things people told me about you that I was mm -hmm. reading into your word or that I would even pray and assume about you. But I, I really hadn't experienced who you really were. And, uh, and as I started bringing those difficulties, those preconceived ideas, my systematic of tulip and all of the other paradigm, my atonement theory, all of this, mm -hmm. that tulip withered. But out of that, mm -hmm. I, I, I said, oh my goodness, here's the sure foundation. Here's Jesus Christ. And he is way more lovely and, and beautiful. And I'm way more in need of him than I ever did. I don't care what sort of lip service I paid his sovereignty before my exodus of Calvinism, but mm -hmm. exodus of Calvinism, I, I sit back and I see my my dependency infinitely more. But mm -hmm. Those issues just kind of withered by the wayside. Now I'm still I'll still find a doctrine that I have questions about, but now I don't have that apprehension about taking it to him. I, I go, oh, you know, now now I call it I call it my um, uh, not my spider sense, but my um, cognitive dissonance will start tingling, <laughs> and I <I'll> say, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I, I like cognitive dissonance now. Whenever it, my head starts to hurt, I've trained myself to say, stop, something's going on. Let's dig in. All right, Lord, let's work through this. And So you actually feel safe now with some, the person you've been calling the Savior. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and, and again, does every Calvinist share that? I'm not going to say that. I suspect. <laughs> I suspect. But, right, but, right. but, you know, that I can only speak for me. Exactly, exactly. But that was something that Calvinism had produced in me. So is that anecdotal? Mm -hmm. Is that demonstrative of the entire systematic? We'll let our viewers decide. But what I did find was, as I, as I was willing to let go of Calvinism, I actually was able to finally take hold of, of who Christ was. Mm -hmm. it was. It was, you know, some people will say, oh, you got saved. And I was like, well, I'd always trusted in Christ. I'd always believed in him. But it was more of like watching your neighbor mow his lawn, you know. You you, you go, oh, I know him, you know, I know him, but but I'd only known him about him on an intellectual level. I'd never right, seen, right. Yeah. encountered and experienced him. And I, I think what happens is, is once you actually know these uh, foundational tenets of who God is, without all of the add-ons, um, and you encounter these sort of issues, it, it it's not even it's not even it's not even a a stumble anymore. You just sit back and you right. say, you know, boy, there's something going on here. Let's get the Bible out. You know, let me let me do so. Study. So yeah, did you did you notice a restoration of like the way you worded things is, is a very interesting way to word things. How where would you say curiosity played into that? Would you would you say that you became more curious as this transformation transpired? Oh, I, I would say that's an understatement. I. All of a sudden, I was afraid to look at other perceptions of, of Christ. I was afraid to consider other doctrines or other views. Yeah. But once all of that kind of came open, and I was just it was just me and me and Jesus. He's the sure foundation, and I'm I'm going to bring everything else to him. I'm not I'm not presupposing anything except you, Christ. You're the you're the yeah. sure foundation. That's it. Yeah. I would bring one thing to him with trepidation. And mm -hmm. He would reveal in in his word, right? I don't want to be accused of a Gnostic uh, divine revelation. It was just <laughs> it, it was just biblical truth. But but when that when that issue would be clarified, I would get excited and I'd go, oh, yeah. now I can trust him with this doctrine. And then before you know yeah. it, I'm showing up with an eighteen wheeler full, and I'm backing the truck up, and I'm like, all right, Jesus, let's go through this. And I just got really excited and passionate. And what I what I would what I would describe it as is taking ownership for my own doctrine. I stopped relegating 
my thinking to someone else and I took ownership yeah. over my own studies. So, yeah, you, I've, one of the characteristics I noticed w with people that are ideologically possessed, whether they're Calvinist or otherwise, is a profound lack of curiosity. There is no, there is no inquiry, this, this drive to know more, to discover. It's, it's like all the discovery has already been done, and now my job is to make the facts fit what I think has been discovered. Mm -hmm. There's no more curiosity. And that's, that's very troubling and concerning. Yeah, you know, it was it it, it it was a situation to where um by the time by the time I'm in that moment, I am so committed to Calvinism um that I thought if there was ever an issue, I just needed to be a better Calvinist, you know? And mm -hmm. uh and yet when all of that was stripped away, on the other side of that terror was was deliverance and joy. And uh, so, now there's this passion about digging into doctrine and studying and considering, you know, am I wrong in this issue? Am I wrong in that issue? I'm, I have great convictions on various doctrines now because I've studied them. But at the time, it was it was I was assuming this was true because I'd been told it was true and I'd been told repeatedly it was true. But when did I ever actually stop into a Bible study on that particular topic? Yeah, yeah, that's. I, I think one of the vulnerabilities, speaking of vulnerabilities in Christians that can result in Calvinism or any really ism is the craving for certainty. Mm -hmm. Does that makes sense. We're really, it's very relieving to us to, to have certainty established for us. So to, and if we can't establish it ourselves, it's very comforting to have somebody who can establish it for us. Like if you have an authority figure to tell you, yes, this is the answer to your question. We, we just take it and we like it. We like the certainty. And something I've compared it to in the past is like people, people crave certainty the same way people crave sugar and fatty foods. And as soon as you hit the certainty, you are no longer engaged in the process of discerning or discovering or being curious or doing the, the method of interpretation. You're no longer doing any of that. You just had all that stopped by the imputation of certainty, however you got it, okay? And because people crave certainty, like, so there's two things that need to happen here. Like if, if you took, if you look at like fast food stuff, if you want to develop yourself well, you need to follow nutrition and exercise and things like that. But if I know that people crave sugar and fatty foods, I can market McDonald's to them because it will sell. You see, so in the smorgasbord of of Christian denominations, you essentially you essentially are what they're really selling to people is we offer better certainty than other people. If you come to the Jehovah's Witnesses, we have all the answers. We, we, if you come to the Mormons, we have all the answers. And that's one of the ways like Southern Baptists are one of the biggest people that Jehovah's Witnesses prey on because they, they have more answers than their Southern Baptist pastor does. Okay. And then the independent Baptists, we have all the answers and the Calvinists are like, we have all the answers. So you, there's like a, it's like a capitalistic competition and the thing that they're selling is certainty. And just like fatty and sugary foods, it comes at the expense of intellectual health or in, in what you might call wisdom health. The longer you spend in uncertainty, the more practice you're getting in using discernment and becoming wise. So the faster you convey certainty, the less opportunity you have to become a wise person. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. So once you realize that, you get to a point where you kind of start to discipline yourself in practices of uncertainty. In other words, be satisfied to not know and just like maybe this will take two years and be okay with it taking two years. And then eventually you get to the point where you crave a little bit of uncertainty, the same way you get that really good feeling when you're, you know, bench pressing 250 pounds, you just feel all the muscles rip through. You just know that you're developing into something. And when we confer certainty to people with our paradigms, 
we take all that development away from them and then the next generation of Christians will never become wise people. And so this Second Timothy chapter 2, the, the passing down of the faith to the next generation is not passing down propositions that we are certain about to them that they have to continue passing down. We have to pa pass down a process of how to grow in wisdom, use discernment, and cope with uncertainty as you develop into a wise person. It's not about the propositions. It's not. It's about, it's about are you becoming more like Christ? And the Calvinism is an artifact of a marketplace of ideas where the constituency of that marketplace craves certainty. Let's, let's talk for a minute. I think those are really great points. Let's talk for a minute. If, if you believe that you were created um, sinful, guilty, that, that God doesn't view you guilty for what you've done alone, but he views you guilty for what, what Adam did, if, if you were created under his wrath, and if you affirm this deterministic sort of view, how does that impact you as a follower of Christ with regards to repentance, confession? How do you view your sin? Um, do, do you see? Do you see any? And I mean, I certainly do. I see a byproduct of Calvinism that 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 is is almost feeding stagnation, and it's feeding this sense of victimhood. Where there is no, that when you say there's no gospel in Calvinism, as, as a former Calvinist, when I look back, I felt trapped. I felt like I, I, if I sinned, it was because God had decreed it, caused it, and I, and I was just helped. Yeah. I was, a, I was a, a leaf swept about in the, in, the, in the breeze, and I would go wherever I had to go. If I sinned, it was because God decreed it. I had no hope of ever, ever, ever doing otherwise. And, and do you see any sort of um, impact? I mean, uh, at, I mean, I, personally, I, I see it impacting not just the Christian, but pretty much all of society, because Christians are supposed to be salt and light. And when the Christian doesn't have hope, when the Christian is hopeless, when the Christian sees himself as a victim rather than an overcomer, I, I see that as having complete ripple effects throughout all of all of society. It's interesting that you would go through all of society that way because I'm I'm trying to think in my mind, like I know Calvinists who <clears throat> have interpreted bad things that have had like health problems and things like that. There was a a couple that I knew about where the wife was sick and there was a possibility that she could have gotten a cure a certain way, but they decided not to pursue it. Kind of like the Stonewall Jackson thing, just because like if God wants to take me, you can't say will, we can't go against God's will. I'm like, well, maybe it's God's will for you to pursue the cure too. <laughs> you know, how, do you, how do you assess that? It also removes a whole bunch of wonder and curiosity about the cause and effect inner workings of the things that we find in Scripture. If you think just God's dictating all these things, the Bible becomes a very dull book. And um, like so in society, I mean, that... I'd be curious how that plays out, but that does kind of remind me of like in the social justice warrior movement, you have you have an equivalent of original sin or total depravity, and their equivalent for original sin is white privilege. And they're but the problem Calvinism has something they don't have. Well, really, maybe not really, but the, the problem with that total depravity is that not everybody has it. And there's no cure for it. There's no, there's no redemption, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you, <laughs> and so you have a version. It's something that James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian have pointed out. If you want to go look up James Lindsay stuff, he has a lot of YouTube videos it, it, comparing the social justice warrior movement. White privilege is their version of Calvinistic total depravity. And he's an atheist, but he understands Calvinism to the point where he can connect that, you know, abstract model there. But yeah, that's kind of interesting how that would uh, go out and affect the rest of society. I'd be curious how else you see it affecting the rest of society. I don't know if if you're if you're dealing with if you're dealing with atheists. Let's say let's say most atheists have encountered this Augustinian. It's a Roman Catholic or Reformed 
derivative yeah. of the state version of Christianity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what they are railing against. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself, this, this, I, I, I won't, I won't say they're not Christians. I, I believe they were. I believe I was a Christian. I just wasn't a very good one. But let's, mm -hmm. let's say that we're um, barely functioning Christians and they encounter mm -hmm. that. That puts an obstacle between them and the Lord. So this Augustinian derivative is actually an obstacle on the, it's an impediment for them to come to faith. And so because of that, you see it impacting the unbeliever. But then you also see the way that we raise our children. You know, we're told they're vipers and diapers. When they cry, they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that they're- Come forth they're, speaking lies and all that. And yeah. rats and, you know, every baby that, that dies deserves God's wrath. And, and you've got all this, there's some inconsistency there among Calvinists. Some of them will say every baby. Right, right. That kind of gets the rid of, kind of monolithic gets rid of, on those things. Well, it, it gets rid of um, unconditional election because now God's a respecter of age. You know, yep, <laughs> every, yep, that's right. the infant goes to heaven. But so, so you get into those sort of issues. But you see these ripple effects throughout society. And today, as I was preparing for the show, I was kind of reflecting back on the way that I viewed my own children during that short time that I was a parent and a Calvinist. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking uh, to, to, to say the least. But if you, if you sit back and you think uh, generationally, if I had raised my children to believe that they were created sinful and that they are guilty and they're accountable and that the, basically the, the God who they're supposed to look to as their deliverer is also their tormentor and their persecutor, yeah. Then, then it, it creates generational problems on how a Christian will understand God. We create generations of atheists, generations of dysfunctional Christians, and and that that impacts man. But tell a child that they were created in the image and likeness of God, and that there's two roads that they can choose. To quote the DDK, they can choose the road of life, they can choose the road to death. Nobody developed a character overnight. You're not, you know, you're, you're not born and all of a sudden you're an arsonist. You're not born and all of a sudden yeah, yeah. you're committing grand theft auto. Nature and nurture, yeah. But it takes little steps. And so which little steps are you going to take today? Are you going to do the things to develop a nature and character that emulates God and you're supposed to be his image bearer? Or are you going to twist that and pervert that? And when you do, you're responsible because you could have done other, otherwise. Yeah. So repent and return to him. If we actually taught our children Biblical responsibility and the goodness of God and his desire and willingness to forgive. How transformative would that be throughout our society? You know, I mean, I, you talk about the negative impact of Augustinian philosophy, but the love and goodness of God on display in the lives of his people. Um, you know, I'm not a mill, but that that would do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um. I would like to even take it one step further and not if passing down propositions is is not a good thing it doesn't matter whether they're true or false passing down propositions alone is not a good thing so I would I would prefer to foster a child's curiosity to the point where they discover these things rather than just tell them those things mm -hmm. but that's I guess that's a that's a process preference of mine well, when I when I'm dis, when I'm when I'm discipling my children, um, you know, one of the things I'm very careful to tell them is that it's my sincerest hope that as they grow, and they're serious about their own walk with the Lord, that they will find those things in my life where I need correction. And so, yeah. by being that vulnerable and open with your children, I see that encourage them to take even further ownership with their studies because they're saying, "Oh, wow." You know, I respect and love my dad and he knows a lot of truth, but there's still areas where I could help. I could correct him. And uh, and I see that 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 gets them jazzed. That's, I mean, they want to their the, uh, after I tell them that, you know, they want to go. They, get, they have to. That's wrong. That's the role of the child. The child. Um, now, <laughs> Jesus restores the kingdom is what he does. 
He doesn't overthrow it. He doesn't usurp it. It doesn't do anything like that. And your children, like a, when Pinocchio becomes a real boy, he has to rescue his father from the whale. When Simba grows up, he has to restore the kingdom of the father. It, the, whatever, whatever the father did wrong, when, when the child comes of age, it is their duty and responsibility to restore the father, to restore the tradition that came before them. Mm. And they have to go out and tangle. They have to become a, a virtuous and wise person so that they have the skill set to do that. Because when they're teenagers, they're going to see everything that's wrong with you, but they're not going to know how to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to go out and tangle with the world a little bit. And then when they t struggle with the world a little bit, then they're going to get a little bit of uh, a little bit of skill under their belt about how to tangle with the world. And then they can come back and and help Warren and Kevin see what they did wrong, and and you know rescue them from the whale maybe. And 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 um, you know there's there's um there's this idea that seems to persist throughout Christianity, uh, at least the, the Western variation here, where if you, if you, if you just, if you just repeat after me, everything's going to be okay. And we, we, what's funny is, as, as a Calvinist growing up, uh, you know, we didn't have altar calls. We didn't have, right, right. you know, we didn't have uh, pray the Lord into your heart. But we yeah. had our own version. It was repeat after mm -hmm. me. It was tulip. It was these, you know, God is sovereign. It was these, these eisegetical <laughs> And so yeah. uh, we're not necessarily committing and manifesting it in the same way. We're guilty of the same, the same. We're kind of doing the same thing in a different way. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's this pendulum that, that tends to swing. And, and, and so I don't want to be reactionary and say, well, Calvinism's wrong. So I'm just going to run off in a, in a random opposite direction. Right. I just want to know what is truth. And, uh, and I, I love, I love your ministry because um, one, I understand it because it, it speaks to where I, I come from and where I am, but it also mm -hmm. it also shows how the faith, Christianity, is a reasoned, a rational, a logical. Mm -hmm. it, it's not it's not just a, a yeah. It doesn't it doesn't go against the mind. The mind it doesn't go against the reason. God gave us faculties for a reason to use them, mm -hmm. and yet mm -hmm. this Western Christianity, this Augustinian tradition really asks us to suspend their use. And and recently when I was discussing the the undercutting defeater with inherit with inherent within total depravity, uh, I actually had off topic some Lutherans, uh, very yeah. nice guys, but they were saying, well, we don't use our mind. We don't use our soul, our flesh, our will, our body to understand spiritual truth. You know, we, we don't do that. We just we just receive it from God. We're processing it apart from who we are. And, and so you get some That's very bizarre, really weird, bizarre answers here, um, but it's basically a, a, a faith that's rooted in in bias. It's not it's not mm -hmm. a reasoned, rational um, understanding of Scripture. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So um, let's do this. Um, I was going to hit on the topics of uh, of tulip, but I think I think we're we're pressed for time. So. Um, do you see, it doesn't take long. <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I, I could talk, I could talk with you for, for hours here. Uh, yeah, same. Do you see any, uh, questions that came up or anything you want to add while I'm searching through here for you? Oh, there's, there's a comment section, isn't there? There is. Oh, wow. We've got a lot. Here. Let me look. Um, oh yeah, it's quite a, there's quite a few there. Here we go. So I'm not Bill, literate, so. Bill said, I completely agree with this idea that most people lack curiosity. We're seeing it uh, in the current situation with the COVID lockdowns. Uh, trust the science, but, but don't read it. And, and so really curiosity can, can impact every aspect of the way that we interact with the world around us. It's not just religion, but science and politics. I um, don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. I'm, I'm trying to scam through these too. Here we go. So here is um, one of the oh, I found out I'm an open theist. Huh? That's good. I found out I'm an open theist. That's good to know. Yeah, you're, you're an open theist. Uh, I, here's one of the many personalities. of. <laughs> I always, always find that out every time I talk to a Calvinist because, you know, I, I guess I forget between times. Here's a here's a, one of many personalities from a lady on, on Twitter. It goes by uh, many, many handles. Uh, Pink, Space Barbecue, Pat, um, whatever we say will be 
that's you nick misrepresented that's on really her twitter weird. very I, I expect you and i will both be making some some page uh appearances there but she's saying that uh if it is if it is a she i, I don't know uh, curiosity is what drew me into the study of sound doctrine i had questions that needed answering so pre affirmation of calvinism uh, yeah people are asking questions and and that's what drew them into calvinism it it Calvinism is very appealing. For me, the idea of guys with beards way longer than mine who had been respected <laughs> for hundreds of years, you know, that were wearing sports coats and smoking cigars, drinking brandy and some, uh, you know, study in, long ago or, or yeah. uh, were, were in charge of the state. I mean, all of these things were very appealing to me. And the fact that they had been highly regarded made it seem almost like they were reliable. Well, this phrase, sound doctrine, when people say the word doctrine, even people who aren't Calvinists, they, they typically mean propositional statements that they regard as true. Yeah. And what I see in Scripture, when I try to let the context interpret itself, I'm seeing doctrine as a policy principle or procedure by which God operates. It's more like whenever we use the word doctrine, like the Truman doctrine or the Bush doctrine or the, you know, that kind of thing, it's a policy of action. When the word doctrine shows up in scripture, it's more like that rather than a propositional statement regarded as truth, regarded as a truth claim. And so that the, just when somebody says sound doctrine, whether they're a Calvinist or a Bible believer, it automatically kind of grates me because I, I know they're thinking of propositions rather than policy of action. Well, here's here's a, a nice little misrepresentation. Uh, God chose the elect, and in your view, the elect elect themselves. Um, That's not my view. <laughs> Whose view? Is it your view? It, it, it's funny because... Um, uh, the misrepresentation that you'll find on here is is astounding. Here's, here's a well, they can't deal with what we actually believe, or what our perspective is. They have to misrepresent it. Um, let's see here. By the way, speaking of elect, I have a whole. I have two videos on elect, election word occurrence, anal word occurrence analysis, and election. It's nothing like you were told. And in scripture, election is never about salvation. It is always about service or blessing. And that's one thing that we would need to point out. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to go, if, to look at the issue of election, go look at those two videos. Oh, here's a question from uh, Derek over at uh, Irresistible Truth. Uh, why do so many non-Calvinists and atheists use the same arguments against other believers? You'd have to specify the arguments and then ask the people using them. Um. Here's here we go. Here's another one. Total depravity is a bothersome doctrine for those who seek to find the inherent goodness in man, which, by the way, isn't there. Total depravity is a bothersome doctrine for those who think Scripture is true. <laughs> hey, hey, man. That's really all. I, I really don't care about man, or it has nothing to do with that at all. And you know, I'm not going to argue that man's good or anything. But um, total depravity is this. They want to say total depravity, but they don't really mean total depravity. There's all kinds of things totally depraved people can do. They can get married. They can buy a car. They can save kids from burning buildings. They can make decisions and they can believe things. What a Calvinist actually believes is that a totally depraved person only really has one thing they can't do. They can't believe the gospel. That's the one thing a totally depraved person can't do. Of all the things they can do, why can't they do that one? Why do you have this special category of thing they can't do, given all the other things that they can do? Well, it, in, in that system, in that system, total depravity renders the gospel pointless, worthless, because it's not the gospel right, that's right. the power unto, unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation. It's it's pre faith regeneration. That's the it's it's election and eternity past. The, the right, gospel right. is just just icing on a cake. So there's no, yeah exactly like we talked about earlier. There's no gospel in, in Calvinism. So it's it's not about seeking to find the inherent goodness of man. It's seeking to find the inherent truth of Scripture. <laughs> it's, 
if scripture is true, total depravity isn't. That's that's as far as it goes. And if if the phrase total depravity or the or whatever anything like it, if there was a verse in scripture that said you cannot believe the gospel until you're regenerated, that's that's my disconfirmation criteria. If you could just find a scripture that said you cannot believe the gospel until you're regenerated, then I would start considering total depravity. But there is not a passage that comes anywhere close to saying anything like that. It's even worse than that. It would have to say. Uh, even though you're reading this, you can't understand this because it's a spiritual truth. Right. And we would never yeah. be able to have confirmation uh, because even so maybe, if we were reading yeah. it correctly, we would have to sit back and say, well, maybe I misunderstand it. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a self. Maybe total depravity is one of those things that's in the uh, decredit will of God because it's certainly not in the revealed word of God. No. Uh, here we go. Uh, uh, people may use fatalism to falsely honor God. Uh, I think that's many hindus think this would uh should be or maya hindus or maya hindus i don't i don't know if that's a thing i'm not sure but yeah uh you you can you can you can say oh we're honoring god and we're appealing to determinism fatalism but ultimately you're you're slandering and accusing him of every manner of evil under the sun and and what's interesting too is in in this and i'm not i don't want to say the word because I know uh, Acts 17 verse 11 has a drinking game every time we say it. In this, in this particular, I'll go ahead and say it, paradigm. Uh, in this particular paradigm, uh, <laughs> when, you're, when you're dealing with, with um, oh, and I lost my train of thought. That, that, train, that train just- Acts 17, 11, drinking games? Yeah, so, so, so when you're talking about <laughs> honoring God with determinism, uh, it, it, it is it's it's completely dishonoring. It, it's blasphemy. It's it's accusing God of every manner of evil under the sun, and and yet they think that that's bringing him honor and glory to accuse him of of thinking this. But but here it gets worse, and they'll say, well, no no no, uh, we, we're not we're not blaming him. We're, don't you know the Westminster Confession? It says yet he is not the author of sin, but it's yeah, consistent yeah. in eternity past before anyone did any act of evil, God had to yeah. think it up, God had to desire it, God had to decree yeah. it, and then he had to actively bring it to pass. And it's not reactionary. They say not with any forethought either. If you keep reading in the paragraphs in chapter 3 of the London Baptist Confession, he didn't make any of these decrees based on any foresight of whether or not they would happen. So they're not reactionary. Yeah. No, his, his, his decrees are not reactionary. He thought it up, wanted it, and brought it to pass, and so yeah. it is—it's a blasphemy accusing him of evil. Um, let's see here. I'm looking through here. I want to make sure we get these questions answered. Uh, there's a lot of, of side chat conversation here that that uh, that. Yeah. Um. Here we go. Um, the word Warren was looking for was existentialism. Calvinists have a very troubled sense of existentialism. That's a good point. Yes, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, looking through here. You rascals. I'm sure that was asked in Jess. <laughs> no, I am I am not. I'm not uh You're not a Lutheran. You can't be a Lutheran if you're a universalist. Now here this actually triggers a, a question I have for you, Kevin. Um, speaking, speaking of Lutherans, uh, what I've seen, and, and, and this is anecdotal, I don't have any numbers or data. I'm just seeing it enough to where I'm noticing a trend. I'm noticing Calvinists getting fed up with Calvinism. They have, in, they've been challenged and some of them have actually taken up the challenge and have started looking. Some have gone to Rome and become Roman Catholic. Some have gone back to Luther and are converting to Lutheranism. But what you're starting to see, I think, is the tail end of the trend for Calvinism. You know, within, within history, there's peaks and valleys where Calvinism will, will kind of trend upward and then it collapses upon itself. And I think we're beginning to witness the tail end of Calvinism where it's starting to crumble because you're starting to see it becoming more and more uh, noticeable. People who have been running their uh, Calvinist Facebook groups, their Calvinist theology pages, their Calvinist YouTube channels are changing the names and they're becoming Lutheran or Roman Catholic or, or just 
saying, I don't even know what's true anymore. And you're starting to see that kind of collapse. Have you noticed? Yeah, it'd be interesting to see that. I have not specifically. Um, it'd be interesting to see the statistics on that because the way our media works today, it'd be easy for a lot of things to look salient, which might not, in fact, be a trend. That's true. Um, so I would, I would be curious. Yeah, it's, I'd be curious to see that if there's, if that is kind of in its senescence or whatever. And also, not to mention the ones that are becoming atheists. And I've kind of seen that trend a little bit. Here we've got a question from Nathan. He says, having a capacity for faith, that of which we get from God, is man-centered? So I think he was questioning back to some other yeah, Calvinists yes, yes, when he yes. said that, because he's not a Calvinist. This out, that that if, if we say we're created with God-given faculties, yeah. then to use our God-given faculties is not claiming that uh, that, that we are merit, meriting our salvation or that we're taking and stealing honor from God um, because anything that we have, we've received from him. Well, there's this interesting verse in Acts 17, 31, where Paul says, but he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Well, if you look up that word assurance, it is the Greek word pistis, mm -hmm. which is translated as faith, 239 times in the New Testament. It's the same word for faith. So whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, he hath given pistis unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So if Calvinists want to go the Gnostic route that faith itself is a gift, from, really the, the best definition of what the gift is, is in, is in Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 16 and 17. But if, even if you want to twist Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 to say that faith is the gift, it's still given to all men in that he hath raised Christ from the dead. There is nobody without the gift of faith, and like any gift, it just has to be received. And by the way, the gift in Romans chapter 5 that needs to be received, the word received shows up twice, and it, the parsing of the word in Greek is active, not passive. In other words, the recipient has to do the receiving. It's not something they receive passively. That's a good point. Um, here we go. Here's a question for me, I guess. Um, does anybody know what denomination uh, Warren is? Um, I think they meant to say demon. A non denomination no, okay. <laughs> What demon is Warren? What, what demon is Warren? <laughs> I think we may have a few in the chats. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway... Uh, no, I, I was Calvinist. Um, now I'm not really trying to conform myself to any denomination. Uh, I, I don't want any mold uh, restricting me other than Christ. So I'm only trying to conform to Christ and his image. Um, and so because of that, I can fellowship with anyone who names the name of Christ until they prove themselves not to be. So I can I can go and fellowship with um, Calvinists, as long as they're proclaiming the name of Christ, I can fellowship with Lutherans. I can fellowship, although my background, anytime Augustinian philosophy is preached, I'm going to get up and leave because uh, you don't want me standing up and shouting down your pastor. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I kind of would like to see that. Actually, I would go for that. I, I would go. The, I would go for that one. Probably not the other ones. I, we had to stop attending our Calvinist church when I came out of Calvinism because I told my wife, I said, I, I literally can't sit here anymore. I, I'm going to stand up. If I have to attend one more service where they are deceiving the congregation, and, and in many ways they were doing it knowingly, if, if, if that happens, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to shout, and that's how we lose friends, and that's not how you influence people. It's not wise. We I please yeah, don't drag friends and influence church people. Here. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but we 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 attend um, a local Baptist church. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be visiting an Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, church probably in a, a couple weeks once uh, the Corona thing hits. But I can fellowship with anyone who names the name of Christ. But I I would consider myself non-denominational. I'm just trying to be pre-Augustinian little O on my orthodoxy. Now, now, Kevin, I, I believe you're you're Baptist, are you not? I have a Baptist background. Background? I would not. Um, I've tried to. Here's what I found. I was my most recent pastor. I was pastor of a non-denominational Bible church, 
And what I found as a pastor of a church is that I was shaping the propositions to which I was uh, emotionally identifying myself based on what I thought would solidify me within that in-group. Now, that was not entirely conscious. Mm. But as soon as I realized that, I realized also at the same time that one thing, there's a lot of reasons why I stopped doing that pastorate. And, uh, you know, I had some family issues too that I that needed to be taken care of. But while I was out for the family issues, I realized that I had the freedom to actually explore what I thought was true without being afraid of who found out what it was or that I would be ostracized from any particular group because I found it. And so as I move forward, I'm trying to maintain uh, not a disaffiliation, but the affiliations that I do have, I want them to be because of procedural things, not because of propositional things, because I need to maintain my curiosity without pressure to stultify it. It's a good, and, and the in-group pressure actually negatively affects my capacity to conduct sound epistemology. So I have a group that I fellowship with, and you can see it online on Wednesday nights on our FSI videos. But um, I'm trying to disassociate from any of the isms or official labels or denominational names or anything like that for my own sake. And I, I think I think too that there is there, and we've I've talked about this in previous programs. But there is a fear among the laity and even among the the pastorates, uh, the pastors. There is there's a fear, an apprehension about questioning particular denominational norms. And so, so I think it's important that that Christians boldly plunge head first into that, armed with the Word of God and the trust in Christ, and and with with just reckless trust in Him, and not be afraid to explore these ideas and these concepts. Because if they're true, they'll be they'll be proven to be, and if they're not, then they should be revealed to be false. So this is a very interesting thing. How how people are impaired in their epistemology by their in-groups because in-groups can be formed by willful assertions of creel propositions that are not in fact true. For example, I said earlier that all cats or cats are mammals. That's a propositional truth claim, okay? I could say that cats are reptiles. That's not a true statement, but if I get enough people who agree that it's true, I can form an in-group based on it, you see? Mm -hmm. And it is what you might call proxy true. It's not really true, but it's true enough within that niche that it can help me function. I can gain hierarchical status. I can gain solidity within the in-group just by wolf, by joining the others and willfully asserting that proposition to be true, whether it is or not. Okay, And so if I'm in an in-group that believes a pre-trib rapture or pre-millennialism or the virgin birth, whatever it is, if if those if any propositional statements are the normativity of my in-group, I am now very much disincentivized from exploring whether or not these things are true because that curiosity and exploration will jeopardize my position in the in-group and in-groups we are societal creatures in-groups do provide us protection and help us survive and so it, it jeopardizes your position and your hierarchical ranking within the in-group and it oftentimes your capacity to make a living or your like all your friends and social standing and the people that you fellowship with so people think you think it's about propositions you think it's about truth and i'm not just saying you Warren, but we you I when i say you i'm talking about anybody you think it's about finding truth, but really it's it's not. We are more inclined to willfully assert things as true because of how it affects our standing within the in-groups that we're affiliated with rather than whether or not we really think they're true. So especially this day and age. That, so I, I think the cure to that is to not have churches that are, someone's going to cut that out of context and have not have churches. That's not what I'm saying. To not have churches that are based on propositional normativity, but on process normativity. So in other words, a statement of faith of the future would be about the distributed cognition of Ephesians 4.16 and a sound process of Bible interpretation. And if you agree on those methodologies, you can be part of the group. 
And so it won't be an agreement about, there won't be a statement of faith that we believe this, this, it won't be about conclusions. It'll be about processes. And we form our in groups based on processes that would free us up to be able to explore what the truths are. I like that's, that's kind of my vision for where the church should go. No, I like it because it what it does is is it it makes it makes the to use your phrase here the, the in group it makes the in group one that is committed to to a process of pursuing truth. Yes. But it, it's yes. not committed to one particular individual or individuals collective of proposition yep. of a perceived truth. Right. It, this right. is this obviously wouldn't apply to essentials of the faith like Christ is God and he rose again those those I'm sure would would serve as your your starting points but everything stemming from that would then well see why would you need to have that as a starting point why not have the starting points as your three basic axioms God the Bible and and um, truth mm -hmm. have those three starting points and everything else that is sound will result from those if you follow the process yeah. So what you want is axiomatic minimalism. You don't want there to be anything that people are afraid to say beyond those axioms. Yeah, and, and, and I've noticed I've noticed um, in in my online interactions with other um, other individuals, you know, I, I deal with um, various understandings of the Trinity. I deal with modalism, Unitarians, um, uh, adoptionists, all, all sorts of things. And um, I, I think that that approach that you're recommending would would make it safe to ask the tough questions. If yes, the process that's what you want. Good, then you actually have disciples who understand why we believe Jesus is God, not just Jesus is God, and they have questions they don't have answers to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you're doing epistemology in the correct direction, and. This has the added benefit of it is when people are brought up this way, you would never have to teach apologetics. You would never have to teach it because it would be built into what you believe to begin with. Mm. You would not be willfully asserting anything that you did not do the proper epistemic you know, work behind anyway. So why would you have to be taught how to defend it? You already know how to defend it because you know why you believe it. Therefore, you don't have to be taught. So it would actually save a lot of time on the back end as far as apologetics is concerned as well. Now, when you start talking about this idea of edification, the edification model and the in-group normativity being about process rather than proposition, it freaks people out. It, they have never seen a church like that. I have never seen a church like that. And people think they're losing something. They think that... Well, what's our foundation? And how are we going to assure that people don't get into false doctrine? They got all the, all those fears are based on wrong ideas. You're emotionally not you, but people are emotionally attached to the wrong concepts of how church should be done when you look in the New Testament. So, <laughs> I would encourage people. This is probably new information for a lot of people. Just to think about it for six to eight months, and think about it. Keep thinking about it, and you will. <laughs> and keep praying. Keep. Keep reading your scripture, and you I think you will start to see things a different way, and you will start to understand that it is actually much safer, much more anti-fragile, and is much more perpetuating of the Christian worldview if you do it the procedural way rather than the propositional way. And it, it's not it's not a rejection of truth. It's nope, it, not a rejection of truth. It's on a, how to arrive at it. It's, it's, it, but it's also a way to perpetuate it. And it's a way to create anti-fragile groups of Christians who could not be lied to. That's what it is. You would never have somebody from a group like that going to become a Jehovah's Witness. It would never happen. You would never have to worry about it. You wouldn't have all these Jehovah's Witnesses saying, I used to be a Southern Baptist and until the Jehovah's Witnesses came and told me that we're not going to heaven, but we're going to the kingdom when we die, which by the way, they're right about that. Okay, and they come and point out one or two little truths, and all of a sudden the little cliches don't don't match up anymore. We're children tossed about to and fro with every wind of doctrine, just like Ephesians four says. And the way to become anti fragile is to build that that discerning process where you can separate the the, tr the signal from the noise, and then build up your articulation so that you can rearticulate the skillful the the signal at a higher level of fidelity. Then you got it from, 
And then you create a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop of truth amplification within the distributed cognition group. And suddenly you can't lie to that group. You can't teach them false doctrine. And when people hear about this, they think they're going to lose their, their doctrinal foundation. No, that is the only way to solidify it and make the people anti-fragile against deception to begin with. So I'm pretty passionate about it, if you can't tell. If you, if you, look, at, if you look at the, the methodology that Christ used with his apostles, he, he, would, he would speak to the group, right, often in, in parables, so that the, his, his crucifixion would be fulfilled. But he would take them aside and he would explain to them, this is what is meant. He would open the scriptures and reveal it. But it wasn't just Jesus coming in and saying, hey, I'm, I'm Jesus. J just affirm that. <laughs> just affirm that and you're good. And, and, but I, I would say, I think, I think within the discipleship of the apostles, to a large extent, what you're describing was demonstrated. And what do you, what do you see as an end result? You see people that are willing to be fed to lions that are that are willing to be martyred at the you know burnt at the stake because they know the truth and, and they're so convicted and, and convinced and it, it's not a, uh, a as you say a fragile faith that when right. difficulty comes or a challenge or persecution that that you know you're going to wilt and, and and fade away so that's, that's a very interesting um approach to consider it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know of anywhere where it is actually in practice right now, especially in person. I mean, we're trying to do something online, but you know, there's only it's it's kind of hard to do something like that consistent and online, and especially when you're also trying to hold you know secular jobs and all this kind of stuff. But it's uh, definitely something I think needs to be explored for sure. No, it's very fascinating. It's very fascinating. So um, I'm going to look through the the questions here just real quick and make sure. Um, here we go. The, uh, the correct process will produce the most accurate propositions. That's from Ben Reese. That's a good, good point. That's true. So like in science, if a scientist were to come up and say, Hey, here's this finding, you would not just believe what the scientist said. You would look, you would evaluate the process by which he came to that finding. And that's really what we should do with anything that we find. If you see something in a statement of faith or in a confession of faith, like if you are, like I know a lot of Calvinists who they, we follow the London Baptist Confession of 1689. Well, what examination have you, do you know the processes those people went through to arrive at the London Baptist Confession of 1689? No, they, what are those processes? Can you validate that? Can you recreate those? Can you duplicate that? You can't. What happens is, is it, it, it's, it's just simple repeat after me theology where they say, um, this is what we affirm, and if you want to be with the in-group, you're going to affirm it too. And, th and then here's the next thing. Yeah, and here's the next thing. I mean, he said the right thing. He said the correct processes will produce the most accurate propositions. That is correct, but here's what you when you get the correct proposition, here's what you do with it. Wad it up, throw it away, and do it again. Mm. That's what you do with it. And there's a reason for that because that's – that's how wisdom is cultivated. As soon as you stop with a proposition that you think is sound, it will become the certainty that stunts the growth of the next person. Yeah, and, 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 and when, I'm, when I'm talking to my friends, my family, people that I can trust, or you know, strangers on the internet, um, <laughs> uh, I talk about the importance of tilling you know, the, the soil of our hearts, because we, or even our minds, because the more something like a more well-traveled a road, the, the, the dense that soil gets compacted. And sometimes when we're uh, acting out and, and living out our faith and we're, we're uh, working out a belief system, uh, we tend to take it for granted. We don't go back and revisit why we arrived at where, yes. we, where we came to. We take it for granted. And then, and then after you take it for granted for so long, you have to backwards invent a whole system of apologetics which is what in programming language we would call technical debt to try to put band-aids on all the stuff you didn't do the proper work on. And, and, but if you're, if you're, if you're aware of this, if you're dedicated to a living faith and actively rooting out your, your mind and your heart and saying, why do I believe what I believe and consistently going through that and being open to the, to the scriptures and the, the leading of the Lord. Well, you have a very robust 
faith. You have a very robust understanding of scripture. And I would dare say yeah. you're far more empathetic to those who are approaching it from a different perspective because it's yes. one you once shared, but you were able to- You would have perspectival awareness, yeah. which is one of the four types of knowing. Can we hit this comment here from Irresistible Truth? He says, uh, he or she, whatever it is, it's 2021. You never know these days. Why is LFW libertarian free will based on the pagan Epicure or what? Yeah, based on the pagan Epicure is such a core doctrine in many churches. So let's deconstruct this statement because it reveals some flaws in thinking. First of all, Calvinists are the ones who have it, so it's not whether will is free or not. Any presumption of the free of the human will is a bad axiom. Okay, and the fact that Calvinists hold that they're they the fact that Calvinists hold a presumption of the human will is what the problem is. It's not whether you think it's free or whether you think it's not free or libertarian free or like what Dr. Ken Wilson says, really free <laughs> or not free like Calvinists would believe. Mm -hmm. So non-libertarian free will. So it, it's not whether you think it's free or not. It's that you hold it as an any view of the human will as an axiom to start with. So Calvinists are in error for that problem. Non-Calvinists who hold any view of free will or the will as an axiom are also committing that same problem. So you don't want to commit the same problem that Pelagius and Augustine. That's why they're both wrong. Pelagius... Uh, <laughs> Augustinianism is a, the, you remember the Star Trek episode, Mirror, Mirror? It is a reverse mirror of the exact same errors of Palladianism, mm -hmm. just taking the, a bad axiom the wrong direction, or the opposite direction, okay? They both go the wrong direction, okay? So it's not, libertarian free will is not a core doctrine. It is not any kind of doctrine. It is, so... Our axioms are that scripture is true and scripture came from God and God exists. Those are our axioms. And if you have an axiom that there is no free will, you're the one basing your entire system of theology on either Gnosticism or whatever other kind of paganism you want to call it. So we do not start with free will. We don't actually care about free will. Whether or not there is free will, we don't care it doesn't matter our only concern is if whether or not scripture is true and if scripture is true was god an eloquent enough communicator to where he could say what he meant or was he a bumbling imbecile who needs a bunch of men to explain it for him in a systematic theology it's not about free will it's about whether scripture is true and non-calvinists don't you forget that stop arguing for free will only argue for the truth of scripture because that's the only issue yeah that's a great point because they're already beginning with this error of a preconceived idea that they're committed to and they're arguing against uh, thank you for calling that out that was a uh, our, our good friend derek over at uh, irresistible truth um let's see is there anything else here i want to make sure we get through hey now now, now this rascal, this rascal called me out. I was looking for my Sharpie. I was going to hold it up for him. I, I don't know what happened to my Sharpie. Here's your calculator. Um, I hope that ties you over. I used those uh, as props in a debate a while back with, uh, with Matt Slick to articulate the undercutting defeater of assuming total depravity. Um, it became somewhat of a running joke on here. Uh, so I want to hit, I want to hit Sherry Todd's comment just for, just real quick. She says, Scripture speaks of the will of man, so you should care. We're not saying we don't care, Sherry. What we're saying is that we don't start with it. We're happy to accept whatever Scripture says about the will. We just don't start with a view of it being free or not free. We don't make the mistake of Calvinists of holding total depravity as an axiom or non-total depravity as an axiom. It's not axiomatic. We're fine if Scripture has something about the will that is derivative but in Calvinism, it has to be axiomatic. And we disagree with anything about the will being axiomatic. So we care what scripture has to say about it because we think scripture is true, but we do not start with it. And we don't, when I say we don't care, what that means is 
I don't care which way scripture goes with it. I'm not predisp. If scripture says there's no free will, fine. I'm cool with that, despite the 17 times that it appears. I don't care. Whatever scripture tells me, I'm good with. But the starting point is whether or not scripture is true, not whether or not a particular view of the human will is true. And that's what, that's what when you're talking about an, an axiom, and, and this is a starting point, that would be an extra biblical starting point. Yes. It may be yes. in the Bible, but you're not... You're not beginning in the Bible to get there. right. You're beginning. It's fine to have it as a derivative. It is not an axiomatic starting point, and we have no opinion on. We don't start with an opinion on it, and we don't care where the Bible leads us on it. We just follow what it says. Here we got some encouragement. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> um, now let's see here. Um, here, talk about axiomatic. Uh, man is enslaved to sin prior to salvation. Christ sets us free, he redeems as Jesus saves. Now, what all presuppositions are being loaded into those uh, those assertions? Uh, man well, is Jesus saves those that believe. We were created spiritually dead, guilty, sinful, under God's wrath because he decreed it in eternity past. So if you unpack the statement here, then Christ sets us free. Oh, that's pre-faith regeneration where he gives us spiritual life and faith so that we can believe he redeems us. Well, no, uh, he redeemed only the elect and Jesus only saves the elect. That's that's if you unpack that statement of uh, pink, Pat and space barbecue here and the other half dozen uh, alt accounts, uh, you see that there's a lot being packed into that statement. What, what this statement could be simplified to say, to reduce it down to what a Calvinist really needs the Bible to say that it doesn't say. Man is enslaved to an inability to believe the gospel prior to salvation. That's what they really, that's the one thing they need you to be enslaved to in order for their system to not fall apart. And I've, I've pointed this out in um, uh, our original sin series and in past debates. But what's interesting is about this commitment to total depravity, total inability, is it is a very clever means of spiritual gaslighting where it says, you were created incapable of understanding spiritual truth. But if you can understand this, this is a spiritual truth. If you can affirm this, then it's a good sign that you've been regenerated. And so it creates a dependency. This is no true Scotsman fallacy. Yeah. It, and it creates a dependency where the adherent is looking now because they've been so gaslighted, they're looking for affirmation, and it leads them into this system. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's see here. Uh, Calvinism is institutionalized gaslighting. Big time. Calvinism, I have a few definitions for Calvinism. Calvinism is clever post hoc rationalizations for why scripture is not true. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. Um, but uh, I, I think if you guys have any other questions here for Kevin or, or myself while we're here, go ahead and get those in here we need to hear from you guys um Put that on. here we go uh non-augustinian publicists okay uh where did about your will come into uh the point is that it is freely offered oh, i may have misread that i thought there was a a question for us I think it was a back and forth. Yeah, I think you're right. Here we go. Here's one addressed to me. Uh, Idol killer, if you believe in a different Christ that did not die for all of humanity, and we are supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ, then are Calvinists being conformed to the wrong image? You rascal. You, are, you, are you trying to make me take a tough stand on the internet? Um, no, I, I think there's two types of, of Calvinists, and I've said this um, ever since I came out of Calvinism. You have inconsistent Calvinists who, on one hand, let's see, where's my camera? On one hand, you have Jesus, and you have Calvinism in the other hand. And when there's a contradiction, even though they're assenting verbally that they affirm Calvinism, they actually choose Christ. So they're actually being conformed to the image of Christ in spite of their doctrine. Then you have consistent Calvinists who do the inverse. They choose Calvinism to the detriment of their belief and affirmation and following in, in Christ. And um, it's this latter group that is not being conformed into the image of Christ. The other one is doing it in spite of themselves. Um, and I think that we all can commit that error to varying degree, but 
but no, I, I wouldn't make a broad brush and say every Calvinist um, is being conformed to the wrong image. But I do think that they're all at peril uh, because there is more of a tendency to become a consistent Calvinist if you linger there among the weeds too long. And we read of the parable of the sower, what happens if you tether among the weeds. So I do think that it's very dangerous. Can I throw a brief comment on that? Yeah. Anybody who is tyrannized by a propositional Christianity. In other words, you're captive to a paradigm and your Christianity is basically a set of propositions about truth claims. You are not being conformed to anything. Whether or not you're saved is one thing, but you're not making any progress toward becoming anything like Christ, toward being sanctified, toward being like Christ. Mm -hmm. You can't be if you're propositionally entangled. You can't be. That's my opinion. And then here we've got a comment from Irenic Pelagian. Uh, if we did the process thing, <laughs> uh, Arius would still be an esteemed member of the church, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. And likely there would be disputes of many traditional beliefs, including the Trinity. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if you... I don't think so. I think that people would not care about the propositions. But like they would, they would, you know, you get a proposition, you wind it up and throw it away. You keep going through the process, and then eventually you get to the point where you can see clearly. And when you can see clearly, you no longer need propositions to guide you. That which is sacred is imminent to you, and you are or you are oriented in the right direction, without needing data compression and dexical markers pointing you toward the numinous which you can you which you previously could not see once you can see it once you grow into the wise person you don't need to encapsulate it into propositional statements so they, they would go away and i think i think another byproduct of that approach too uh which i think ultimately we're talking about just spiritual maturity here uh would be to where you're not forcing a belief at the point of a spear or at the tip of a right, sword. Right. Um, but what you're doing is you're coming in and you are engaging in critical thinking and dialogue and working this out with someone who, you know, has a different view or is, has questions and is struggling. And, and like you said, that's the apologetics along the way rather than. Right. Right. Instead back. of having to reverse engineer it. Mm -hmm. no, uh, you know, speaking of at a spear point with people, people being burned at the stake and, you know, forced to believe certain things back in the Middle Ages and things like that. I think we've, we think that it's wrong to kill people for their beliefs, but I think we've retained a vestige of that era, which is, we still separate based on propositional beliefs. We still, we have not spotted all the error of that time frame, and we still carry some of that baggage and we haven't spotted it all yet. It's mm. a good word. Um, reading fatalism into Calvinism is a common trait of anti-Calvinists. Um, I think, I think this, I think you did it, Pink. I think, I think, uh, oh, no, he's back. <laughs> uh, no, I had to go over to the side and take care of something real quick. No, you're good. You're good. I was just joking. Like you finally had, had enough. Um, but no, fate determinism is, is, is fatalism. Uh, everything is already yeah. That's that's gaslighting right there. Yeah, it's somebody when a Calvinist says reading fatalism into Calvinism, that's word games. That's gaslighting. If you if you're a Calvinist and you don't think fatalism is Calvinism, you are gaslighting. You are you're either incredibly inane yourself or you're intentionally deceiving other people. But Calvinism is fatalism. Determinism is fatalism, and that's stop playing word games. And, and the other thing you'll notice it, it's not a trait of anti-Calvin, uh, of those anti-Calvinism, but it's anti-Calvinist. So it personalizes it to gaslight and to get those who are gaslighted on the defense. So it's not, yes. now, I'm, not yes. I'm no longer considering the, 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 the methodology of determining something is true or not, but now it's my team versus your team. How dare you? And I have to defend and circle the wagons and I'm not even going to consider the argument anymore. And that's really, that's pretty, pretty typical there. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Idol killer. Uh, generally speaking, do you guys believe the average Calvinist walking around is saved? Is Matt Slick saved? 
This comes from Derek Morell over at Irresistible Truth. Kevin, I'll let you answer, and then I'll, I, <laughs> I'm just, so I'll, I'll I'll circle back and, and answer as well. What's what's your view? Do you think do you think Calvinists uh, that those who have that written on the back of their shirt, you know, and they have it on their their breast pocket, are, are they saved? Yes and no. I would agree with that. <laughs> I have a video called Our Calvinist Saved, and it's not that I'm trying to draw a conclusion, but it is a, I only have that because people ask the question so many times. Yeah. And that question, um, if they're going to come out and say that Calvinism is the gospel, that would imply that people who don't believe it don't believe the gospel. That, in other words, that's another way of saying that people who aren't Calvinists have not believed the gospel, right? If they are saying that Calvinism is the gospel and that's not true, then they are believing a false gospel. Now, to what degree can somebody be saved and deceived? Okay. And that's, that's, a, that's a legitimate question. Like if somebody is saved as a Southern Baptist and then they get duped by the Jehovah's Witnesses because of propositional certainty that seduces them, okay? Does that mean that they were never saved because they can believe all these weird things or are they saved and they're just cognitively deceived for a while? That's, that question is up for grabs, okay? But the, the deal is procedurally... I am engaged with, I'm going to base my fellowship, like I said before, on people who are trying to go through the process of correct biblical interpretation and the distributed cognition of the Ephesians 4 um, model, okay? Any kind of paradigmatic, or any kind of, drink another one, any kind of ideologically possessed person is not engaged in that process, they're not engaged in that process and would not be part of any fellowship group that I would be a part of. And whether or not they are saved, I don't know. I make the information available to them and what they do with it is their issue. And whether or not they're saved is between them and God. I can only be responsible for how I represent scripture out of my own mouth and with my own life. And, and, one of, and that's all anybody can do. One of the things, too, to elaborate on this, when you talk about saved, um, we, we tend to just kind of wrap it all up and we say, do they believe in Jesus? That's that, I think that's the way it's most commonly used. Are they going to receive eternal life? Um, you know, but, but if you look at what's saved, man, man suffered death as a result of Adam's sin and mortality. Now, I, I tend to view that as more of God's mercy so that we're not suffering for eternity and could be redeemed. But Jesus came and died and as a result conquered the, the grave. And now everyone... The righteous and reconciled are raised to eternal life, while the wicked are raised to judgment, but they're raised nonetheless. So even the wicked, because of the work of Christ, were saved from death. They just rejected it, and thus they experienced the second death. But if you talk about saved in the sense of receiving eternal life, well then, now that's for those who are in Christ. And you can have people that will affirm Christ who aren't truly in Christ. Well, when, when I was talking to Sonny Hernandez, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, when I, I can I can smell the steaks cooking on the other side of the house. I'm sorry. <laughs> when I was talking to Sonny Hernandez, um, he insinuated strongly that if he believed that God predestined all things whatsoever comes to pass, what our friend over here would call uh, fatalism, is what a consistent Calvinist would have no problem with. Mm -hmm. And he said that if you don't believe in the Jesus who predestinated all things, then you're not believing in the right Jesus. He came out and said that. Mm. Okay. And there is no verse that says God or Jesus predestinated everything that comes to pass. There isn't one that says that. So he's, he's false on two counts there. You could turn around and say, well, if you don't believe in the Jesus who died for all, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, then maybe you're not believing in the right Jesus. Now, we do know that there is another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. But it is not a good idea to weaponize the possibility of not being saved. Because that, that puts, it gets into rivalrous mode. Mm -hmm. And instead, what you should be doing is exploring exactly what this thing means to start with. And, and I think that, um, like, 
I think Leighton has some policies like where we don't accuse other people of not being saved and stuff like that. And I think I know what he's saying there, but I, but I think the, the real heart and intent of what that should be, in my opinion, is that we don't weaponize it. Because if you have that opinion, you need to be able to say it. But we should not be weaponizing it in dialogue to try to delegitimize what people say. Like, you're not saved, therefore everything you say is trash. Yeah. It's not like that, okay? But, you know, everybody's got to make that call on what they're dealing with. I do... I think we should avoid the no true Scotsman fallacy, though. And I think, I think, I think a mature Christian, you know, would would constantly instead of saying, you know, you're not saved, you're not saved, they would just say, "Am I in the truth on this? Are you in the truth on that?" And uh, and, and and try and approach it that way. Well, I think I got misunderstood here. Our our 17 Acts verse seven. He says, "Disagree with Kevin. Not every Jesus saves." I'm not saying they do. I, what I I think I tried to be clear that. It, like Second Corinthians 11, not every Jesus saves. It is possible to believe the wrong Jesus. But I'm not going to weaponize... I'm not going to try to win a debate by weaponizing that fact and trying to use it against somebody in a dialogue. Well, and it's not... It's not has, has anybody ever gone up to someone and say, you know, you're, you're wrong, you're not saved, you're going to hell, and, and come in so strongly that... That the individual isn't immediately put on the defensive, I would say maybe that's happened. But generally, as a rule, when you come in and tell someone you're not saved, it immediately it's going to cause them to become uh, on the defensive, and and they're going to stop hearing what you're saying. You know. Yep. yep. And so I, I think that what we're talking about here is more to deal with with tactics than than perhaps. I mean, I've yeah. There's a there's a tactical I component think, for sure. I would I would have a, a question. I would say, woof. They're giving me reason to to think that they're not, you know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would be I would be tempted to say that probably a majority of non calvinists are also not saved. Yeah, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, it, the label the label isn't salvific. The label isn't salvific. It doesn't matter right. what's on your shirt right. or what's on the door of the building that you attend. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter what sort of you know silver fish or whatever you have on the back of your car. That's not that's not going to save you. It doesn't remember it doesn't matter how many passages of the Bible you've committed to memory. You know, it doesn't yep. it, that's not what saves, but in the in West, western Christianity we tend to intellectualize and make it into a formula rather than an actual theosis and a, a relationship with God where we're being conformed into his image and following him and submitting to him. Well, I've got this inkling and I you know I don't know if I'm brave or stupid for saying this, and I'm pretty sure that, every, you know, it'll go both ways, but I've got this inkling that in the Western Christianity, we have grossly misunderstood what the Bible's talking about. Maybe not grossly, but we have misunderstood something about salvation. And I have that inkling that there is a misunderstanding, not, not just in me, but in the way I hear it talked about by, you know, Bible believers and Calvinists and Catholics, whatever, you know, but I don't know what that is. Does that make sense? Like, I, I don't know what it is. I can't sit here and tell you what it is, but I've got this inkling that there's something that's, that we're missing. All of us, we're all missing something. And I'm, I'm kind of like back to square one where like, I'm, I understand all the all the churchy things about. I understand all that. Anything anybody could tell me about salvation that you learn in church, I got all that. But there's something there that we have not hit, and I don't know what it is. And I'm curious about it. I'm actually I'm actually reading the Bible with curiosity, trying to see what this thing is. To 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 say <laughs> I want certainty on this thing, but no. It sounds it sounds like it sounds like maybe your uh, cognitive dissonance meter is tingling a little bit, and you're going, you know, maybe something like that. I want to dig down. Something had, like that. What is it? What is it that we're all missing? I've had experiences like that where I go, you know, I, I can I can't see here, but I, I know that there's a blind spot here, so I need to pay attention to it. That's a good or I suspect that there's one, yeah. It's, it's a real strong suspicion. Now this comes from Aaron. He says, uh, question one of two. Oh, you're sneaking them in today. I, I don't know if I'm gonna pull up the second question, Aaron. I think you're yeah, I think you're you're <laughs> no, I'll I'll answer. Um there are several passages of Scripture that speak of Jesus Christ as the elect one. So if Calvinism is God-centered, then shouldn't they automatically default to Christ? 
well, that's the big, uh, <laughs> if Calvinism is God centered. Yeah. That's the condition. Question two of two, as the doctrine of election instead of themselves as being elect as the doctrine of election, which is undoubtedly more man-centered. Yeah, so that's what you would call, I, what some people would call narcissus. You read yourself. like the What the Calvinist is doing, every time they see the word elect, they're reading themselves into it. Yeah. So eisegesis is reading an idea into the text. Exegesis is pulling the idea out of the text. And what the, to, the term has been coined, narcissus, is reading yourself into the text. And the Calvinistic man-centered view of Scripture reads themselves into the text as the elect, rather than what the text is talking about. And so they, they basically are accusing non-Calvinists of being man-centered, while they themselves are being self-centered, it seems like. Um, Irresistible truth, that was a joke. I am not a universalist. <laughs> It's just that every time, every time you talk to a Calvinist, they can't deal in the arena of ideas, so they accuse you of being a universalist to skirt the fact that they cannot refute what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I got you. Um, here we go. Um, Idol Killer and Kevin, how do we ultimately teach Christian ideology without it becoming a forced hermeneutic the way we see in Calvinism? Hmm. Why, you don't teach an ideology. An ideology, like somebody said, is Kevin ideologically possessed up there? I think Pat, what's her face, said it. And um, an ideology would be a set of ideas that is defined by a set of propositions, propositional truth claims, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're not dealing with propositional truth claims. We're dealing with procedural empowerment claims and participatory knowing and the distributed cognition of the edification model of Ephesians 4.15 along with um, perspectival awareness and perspectival knowing, which show you going back and forth between the four kinds of knowing at all times, and you're going to intentionally try to avoid being captive to any particular ideology. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole point here would be that that you're you're somewhat neutral with with that. It, it's just it's a method in which you go about determining truth that you're right. committed. So you can hold things, in, yeah. You can hold things in possibility space. Like I, be, okay, this X Y Z doctrine. Eh, it's, I'm about sixty percent on this. Sixty percent confidence level of that is propositionally true. And that's a, okay? that's a good point. I want to highlight here. And, and why do you have to marry yourself to it? I may be sixty percent confident, but but there, it seems like people feel they have to be 100% confident on every belief that they have. But it's okay to sit back and say, I'm still searching this out. I'm still studying it. You know, right now I'm 5149, you know, or I'm 8020. Um, but but within modern... Well, anytime, you, anytime you're at 100% on something, that should be a red flag to you. Yeah. Um, Uh-oh. Now, now this is this is some of us have to open up the church tomorrow. This is uh, hitting the uh, Kenyan marathon mark. Okay. No. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I think I think with uh, with that reminder, and I know with your steaks cooking on the uh, on the grill in the other room here, I think I think we can wrap it up. Is there anything you want to say um, in, in parting words to uh, to anyone out there? I think I've said everything that um, I need to say in the allotted time. Gotcha. Well, uh, everybody, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. We've got lots more uh, great content. Mm -hmm.